There is too much torment bottled up inside of me. Too much anger that needs to be rid of. I should be castrated or have an electrode placed in my head to stop my stupidness or whatever. I'm just a lost soul looking for release of my madness. Please, God, let someone help me. Arthur Shawcross, March 1990. Arthur Shawcross, a.k.a. the Genesee River Killer, was truly mad. This incredibly mentally unstable serial killer murdered two children in Watertown, New York in 1972, and then later, 11 women in Rochester, New York in 1988 and 1989. He earned his nickname from the fact that most of his victims from the 80s were found near the Genesee River in New York State. Arthur first turned his attention to children, targeting kids at a local playground, somehow earning their trust by playing with them, taking them fishing, being a super creepy, why didn't anyone run, run him out of town forever or kill him secret adult friend? Arthur was able to lure two children he'd befriended into the woods and brutally rape and murder them. And after being apprehended, he was given one of the worst plea deals of all time, serving less than 15 years in prison before being paroled. After outraged parents ran him out of the first several communities he was placed in, his criminal record was sealed and he moved to Rochester, New York to start a new life he never deserved to live. Less than a year after he settled in, he started killing again. No longer children, this time local women. Sex workers in Rochester became his new primary target. Vulnerable women walking along the streets of downtown looking for clients, slipping off into strangers' cars, dark alleys, and abandoned places became easy prey for a terrifying new predator. Why was Arthur Shawcross such a monster? He was a child rapist, child killer, a woman rapist, woman killer, domestic abuser, arsonist, cannibal, and more. Something was very wrong with this guy. No one was ever able to completely figure out exactly what it was. Arthur received multiple psychiatric diagnoses throughout his life. No two psychologists could ever agree on exactly what was wrong with him. But a pattern did emerge. Depressed, antisocial, cognitively prone to violence, sexually dysfunctional, poor impulse control, pathological lying, and difficulty distinguishing fantasy from reality. Arthur grew from an especially odd little boy into a monstrous man with an explosive temper. How did that happen? A series of serious head injuries certainly did not help. And he was born with some brain abnormalities. Today, we'll discuss some psychosocial factors connected to Arthur's serial killing, the setting of Art's crimes, Art's life from beginning to end, who many of his victims were, and more in this, you might want to make sure that your kids are always wearing helmets, that they definitely never talk to strangers, and definitely don't play with them on the playground, true crime, serial killing, why was this guy ever let out of prison edition of Time Suck? This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Thanks for joining this uh, meeting of the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, the master sucker. Suck nasty, sir sucks a lot. Uh, psychiatric asylum orderly slash patient. Playground bouncer. And you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina. Praise the bestest boy, Bojangles. Penny Pooper and Ginger Bell's favorite character slash God. And glory be to Triple M. Uh, just one announcement. And there's so much show today. Uh, this is a wild one. <laughs> this is uh, a especially crazy story. Uh, we have a uh, a new uh, wild shirt in the store at badmagicmerch.com. Wild, maybe it's going to be my word of the day. Uh, Happy Valentine's Day tie-dye shirt featuring lovers Fred and Rose West. Yes, those serial killers, the world's most unlikely love duo. Very, very dark symbol of hope for lovers, if you frame it in the right way. Right, if those two absolute fucking maniacs, those dirtbags, could find romantic love, well, I guess we all can, right? All right, there's a chance for all of us. And now let's get into this. I'm going to give this uh, a rare trigger warning. This episode is especially brutal with upcoming mentions of child murder, child rape, genital mutilation slash cannibalism, uh, vampire of Sacramento, Ed Kemper level of brutality ahead. And I realize I'm very inconsistent with these warnings and that I have not given them previously for equally brutal episodes, but I thought of it today. <laughs> this uh, this episode, uh, man, freaked me out a bit. Uh, so here we are. Arthur Shawcross, the Rochester Strangler, absolute fucking maniac, the Genesee River Killer. Uh, since most of Arthur's crimes took place when he was living in Rochester, where the Genesee River cuts right through town, let's familiarize ourselves with that area first today. And then after that, we'll go over a lot of psychiatric speculation as to just exactly what the fuck was wrong with this dude's brain. Then it'll be timeline time. Uh, Big timeline. 
today, covering uh, the history of his head wounds, being a fucking weirdo, uh, his military service, uh, first killings in Watertown, uh, incarceration, a lot more killing in Rochester, uh, more incarceration, death. Uh, and then I'll share some final thoughts before, of course, heading into a preview of next week's show and some Time Sucker updates. Uh, Rochester lies in Monroe County and is the fourth most populous city in New York State. 2020, the population inside the city limits was reported to be 211,328, which makes it seem smaller than it actually is. Uh, the metro population currently hovering around 1.1 million. So it's the 52nd largest metro area in the U.S. Small compared to, you know, a giant metropolis like New York City, but still a pretty decent sized city overall. Pretty damn cold city as well. It's a 330 mile drive northwest from New York City built on the banks of Lake Ontario, which it shares with Canada. Lies roughly 100 miles east of St. Catharines, Canada, where the recent dark stars of the Ken and Barbie Killers episode, uh, Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka, did their killing. Or a lot of it. Uh, well, I guess, you know, uh, they didn't do a lot of killing. But, you know, did a lot of their dirty deeds. Rochester gets some serious winters. Very snowy city. One of the snowiest cities in the U.S. Uh, so much that lake effect snow, which I've driven through uh, doing stand-up gigs years ago. That's a crazy thing. Uh, Rochester averages 99.5 inches of snow a year. So over eight feet. Not far behind America's snowiest major city, Syracuse, New York, which sits just over 80 miles to the east of Rochester and averages 123.8 inches of snow a year. Coldest month is January, averages a low of 18 degrees Fahrenheit, high of 32. Hottest month is July, averaging a high of 81, low of 61. So it rarely gets truly hot there. Very mild summers. Uh, Despite being a bit frigid, Rochester was one of the very first boom towns the U.S. ever had due to the fertile uh, Genesee River Valley surrounding the area. It boomed back before U.S. settlers knew how much better and more livable the climate of the Southwest was, before anyone had a chance of running an orange orchard or something down by the beach somewhere in present-day Southern California. You know, people were like, ah, it's fucking great here. I mean, a little bit of snow. Yeah, I mean, yeah, qu- quite a bit of snow. Probably going to lose a few villagers every winter. But overall, wow, uh, what a beautiful place to live. Uh, the area was originally settled by the Seneca an indigenous band of people who spoke Iroquois, then resettled by Puritan descendants looking for new farmland. On November 8, 1803, Colonel Nathaniel Rochester, Major Charles Carroll, and Colonel William Fitzhugh Jr. purchased a 100-acre tract from the state along the Genesee River. Uh, Beginning in 1811, the three founders surveyed the land, laid out streets and tracks. In 1817, some additional landowners joined their lands with the original 100 acres, and the village of Rochesterville was formed. How fun to plan out a town, by the way. That's some real-life Minecraft or Sim shit. I mean, I'm sure it was a ton of work, but how rewarding would it be to buy some raw land, zone it all out, sell plots for residential, commercial, or industrial use, pick out some parks and city municipal buildings, you know, where they're going to be, watch the community you planned actually be settled, turn into a city, you know, raw land to a city before your eyes. Love it. Now, the original U.S. settlers chose the area due to a combination of fertile farmland, some high waterfalls that could provide abundant water power and a location on the shores of Lake Ontario, you know, that made it a good spot for uh, shipping. City's founders were able to watch their community grow, thrive in their lifetimes. They chose their spot well. In uh, 1821, Rochesterville was the seat of Monroe County. It became a regional manufacturing center and the home to numerous flour mills. So many flour mills that Rochester, the Ville, you know, uh, dropped by 1823, became known as Flower City. Flour, man. I don't really think about it that often. That's sweet grain, ground down into a fine powder. Uh, That shit was super important in early America. I mean, still important now, but, uh, you know, more so then. One of the first products in America to become industrialized. Bread was, largely still is, staple of American diets. And you can make bread and so much more with flour. Flour that can stay good for years when you're out in your fucking homestead cabin or wherever, if stored correctly. Rochester's grain grinding population exploded. By 1820, there was 1,500 people. By 1830, over 9,000. By 1840, over 20,000. Population almost doubled again in the next decade to over 36,000. By 1870, it would increase to over 62,000. And it just kept growing until it peaked in the 1950s at over 330,000. In the early 1900s, Rochester uh, also became a huge national center for America's garment industry. Uh, Rochester would have an incredibly robust diversification of industries. It's the birthplace of numerous giant corporations like Xerox, Wegmans Grocery Stores, uh, Western Union, Eastman Kodak, one of Lindsay's uncles uh, worked for Eastman Kodak in Rochester, uh, many others. 
Wegmans, with over 100 East Coast grocery stores, did over $10 billion in revenue last year. Xerox did over $7 billion. Western Union did over $5 billion. Eastman Kodak did over a billion and uh, used to, along with Xerox and Western Union, do uh, a lot more than that. Last 20 years have been hard on these companies with a rapidly changing marketplace and a lot of new competitors. And the last 70 years have been pretty hard on Rochester. Ever since the early 1950s, the population has declined each and every decade, down to just over 210,000 people now in the city limits. In the 1980s, when Shawcross was killing in Rochester, the city experienced its most rapid population decline ever. People were fleeing the city, fucking droves. Rochester lost over 18% of its population in that one decade. Roughly one in five locals bounced in just a 10-year time frame. So what happened? Well, some think that Shawcross, rather than killing 11 victims there, might have killed closer to 50,000 people. He was certainly capable of it, uh, based on the war gunboat stories he'd share after his arrest. Dude made Rambo look weak. Dude made Chuck Norris look like a 90-pound weakling. He would have just toyed with uh, Alexander Solonik before killing him. If you believe him, which I do not. Uh, no one, of course, thinks Shawcross had a substantial effect on population decline in Rochester. Uh, it was all about job losses. I'll talk about his gunboat stories later. Uh, it was mostly about job losses. To be fair, not all the people who fled Rochester left the area entirely. There was a big post-war push nationwide after World War II for families to live in the suburbs. So a lot of cities experienced population decline you know, inside the city limits, but not like what happened in Rochester. Uh, most of the best jobs went far away as Rochester became another casualty of the Rust Belt. An increase in automation, the transfer of so many manufacturing jobs overseas, a sharp decline in steel and coal production devastated numerous cities in upstate New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky, uh, parts of Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, even Minnesota. In 1970, 152,000 people in the Rochester area worked in industries in the manufacturing sector with an average earning of $68,000 adjusted for 2014 uh, when this particular study was completed, uh, compared with the regional average private sector you know, annual earnings of $53,200. Uh, by 2014, only 61,800 people, just 40% of the 1970 job total, worked in manufacturing in the area, with average earnings of $74,500 compared with regional average private sector earnings of $51,400. So the loss of nearly 100,000 jobs paying significantly more than the average for the area had a devastating impact on Rochester, of course. Less jobs meant less people, less taxes, which meant there was less law enforcement, more people desperate for money. All that combined with America's crack and cocaine epidemic in the 1980s made finding vulnerable people a lot easier, a lot easier for a monster like Arthur. Uh, less resources made it harder to catch a monster like Arthur. And then there was some, uh, you know, shitty choices we'll get into later made by, uh, you know, the parole board and uh, the courts. Uh, Rochester, like many big cities in America, had a high crime rate in the 80s. Murders, rapes, theft, all too common. One stretch of downtown called Lyle Avenue served as the city's red light district. Police work in new cases involving missing and murdered sex workers uh, weekly, uh, oftentimes from that area. Difficult to detect a serial killer who may have been targeting these uh, vulnerable women. Uh, Rochester has also seen a huge resurgence in violent crime in recent years as well. November 12, 2021, Mayor Lovely Warren declared a state of emergency due to a rise in violent crime. There were 71 murders uh, for the year at that point, making it the deadliest year in the city's history. In 1989, when Shawcross was most active, there were 44 murders, you know, and he was uh, responsible for at least nine of them. Shawcross picked up most of his victims in downtown Rochester. Yeah, that Lyle Avenue area. Yeah, he dumped their bodies in the wilderness surrounding the Genesee River that runs right through town. The Genesee River dumps into Lake Ontario at the edge of Rochester after flowing 160 miles north, dropping 2,250 miles, or I'm sorry, 2,250 uh, feet, a little bit different, uh, from its source, a hill in Potter County, Pennsylvania. Uh, the Seneca tribe gave the river its name, Genesee, meaning pleasant banks. Shawcross, obviously, uh, made those banks uh, significantly less pleasant. The river powered Rochester's early flour mills, other manufacturing, still gives power to some of the city today although the vast majority of Rochester's electricity, uh, over 80% now actually, generated by burning fossil fuels such as coal and natural gas. Uh, originally, the River Gorge uh, marked the border between the five nations of the Iroquois. The Seneca Nation lived between the river and uh, uh, Canandaiga, uh, I think is that, Canandaiga Lake. Uh, the Genesee River Basin is a 2,500 square mile basin surrounded by thick woods. Those woods often used as dumping ground for Shawcross to dispose of victims' bodies. 
Sometimes months would pass before their bodies would be found. Some might not have ever been found had Shawcross not been caught and led investigators to the victim's remains. Uh, None of those bodies should have ever been found because those women should have never been murdered. Shawcross should have never gotten out of prison and ended up in Rochester. He only made it there after being released from prison in the prime of his life following getting caught for raping and killing two kids. Then after his release, he was run out of three separate communities all in a short span of time before his parole officers settled him in Rochester, where he had a better chance of hiding his dark past in a bigger city and where his new neighbors would have no fucking idea what kind of monster he was thanks to authorities making the terrible decision. I think objectively terrible decision to seal his records. How fucked up is that? If no community wants you to live anywhere near them because of your truly horrific criminal past, don't you deserve to be ostracized? Who gives a fuck if it's harder for you to to make a new life for yourself? It's supposed to be harder for you. I don't believe in redemption being being an opportunity for everyone. Imagine someone moving in next door to you who had served 14 years in prison for raping and killing two children. How furious are you if you find out they fucking live near you? And then how extra furious are you if something happens in your neighborhood, like a bunch of more uh, murder, a bunch more murders, and then you find out about their past? I can't believe they uh, weren't sued for this. Uh, those records should have never been sealed. He should have had to deal with whatever public hate came his way. He certainly brought that on himself, didn't he? I mean, who gives a fuck? That never gave, never gave him a chance to rebuild his life. The kids he killed sure never got a chance to rebuild theirs. Uh, now that we've looked a bit into where Shawcross did most of his killing, let's look into why Shawcross maybe did his killing. I said he certainly brought that on himself, referring, of course, to his uh, actions, his murders. But I will also say that this guy seems to have really been dealt a very shitty genetic hand at birth. And then he had his already very fragile noodle, scrambled way more than the average bears, with a series of you know significant head injuries. All the more reason for him to have never been let out of his prison cell after those first two murders, though. Uh, He may have truly been someone. It just was literally not possible to rehabilitate. Uh, Arthur Shawcross's adult life was a never-ending series of psychological evaluations and diagnoses. Uh, It seemed like no two doctors could ever give him the same diagnosis. The only thing they all seemed to agree on was that something really not right with this dude. And if you watch any interviews he gave from prison before he died, and he gave several he loved to talk to, uh, you know, journalists. You can immediately see that something is not right with this guy. Like something is wrong with this guy's brain. Something in addition to what has to be wrong with the serial killer's brain for them to do what they do. You know, Ted Bundy has always been especially terrifying to me because he did not seem abnormal when giving interviews, right? What he was talking about sometimes was super fucked up, sure. But the way he talked, the way he carried himself, I could see being tricked by him. Absolutely. Came across as a nice guy, smart guy, likable handsome. If I didn't know he was a serial killer, listen to him. You know, I I would think he was totally normal. John Wayne Gacy, you know, he creeps me out in his interviews. You know, I don't like his eyes, but I don't know if I don't like him because of the way they actually looked or because I know what he did. If I didn't know, he might creep me out, but might, maybe not, you know, but Shawcross, I mean, you listen to him talk for more than 10 seconds in any interview, you know, something is fundamentally wrong with him. He had a very odd speech pattern, his cadence. He had this tick where he constantly like repeated this series of very hard blinks, uh, more so uh, when asked a question that seemed to upset him, uh, the way he seemed to be unable to read the room, like his tone was just very off compared to like like what he was talking about. When people get uncomfortable, he didn't seem to really notice uh, or how they got uncomfortable, not in the right way. Just socially fucking off. Of course he was. His brain didn't work right. Yeah, he presents an interesting case study of how genetics combined with several serious head injuries and maybe some emotional and physical and sexual abuse can create a killer. You'll see why I say maybe later. Uh, dude had a, a very rich fantasy life. Uh, there was likely no one event or trauma that made him a murderer. His murderous nature seemed to be the culmination of a whole series of very unfortunate events. In the future, with advances in psychology, as far as studying you know, psychopathology is concerned, Uh, With advances in neurology, hopefully we can figure out how to test the brains of criminals convicted of certain, especially heinous crimes like Shawcross. And based on their cognitive wiring, you know, figure out who will for sure always be a huge threat to public safety and maybe, you know, never allow them the chance to roam free again. Uh, With Arthur, let's begin our examination of his bloody hornet's nest of a fucking mind uh, by looking at uh, P-roll or pyrrole disorder. I've heard experts pronounce it both ways. Uh, pyrrole disorder seems to be the most common, so I'm going to go with that. Uh, pyrrole disorder was originally identified by Dr. Abram Ho- Hoffer, who suggested that it leads to depletions in zinc and B6, which he felt could alter moods and cause psychiatric disorders. And for the record, his disorder is not an official accepted medical or psychiatric disorder. It is a known chemical imbalance. That's for certain. And that imbalance 
may contribute directly to certain physical and mental dysfunction. Uh, Pyrrole disorder, also known as pyroluria, cryptopyroluria, uh, cryptopyrrole, or MOV disorder. And it involves a biochemical imbalance involving an abnormality in the synthesis and metabolism of hemoglobin, uh, a red protein responsible for transporting oxygen in the blood. I'm no doctor or blood expert, but it sounds significant. Uh, pretty certain that our blood being able to transport oxygen, you know, effectively is fairly important to us not, uh, you know, quickly dying and functioning normally and stuff. Uh, some psychiatrists are convinced that this imbalance causes dramatic shifts in mood that it often occurs alongside and may even be an indicator of some mental health conditions that severely impact one's judgment and understanding of reality, including bipolar disorder, uh, severe anxiety, schizophrenia, also been associated with ADHD, various anxiety disorders, uh, OC, OCD, Tourette syndrome, and other disorders. Uh, abuse, divorce, job loss, uh, a move, other major stressors can increase the risk of elevated levels of pyrroles in the bloodstream of anyone, someone who is not born with this disorder. Uh, those stressors can take someone who, like Shawcross, was born with a constant elevation in pyro levels and make it, you know, much, much worse. Some com- common symptoms, and he didn't seem to handle stress well at all. Some common symptoms of pyrrole disorder include, and again, this is not agreed on by everyone, uh, more study needs to take place, but irritability, severe anxiety, significant changes in mood, short temper, severe depression, short-term memory problems, inability to manage everyday stress, uh, histrionic, aka melodramatic behavior, sensitivity to loud noises, lights, or both, increased aggression, violence, Dr. Richard Krauss, psychiatrist for the defense at Arthur's Rochester trial, believed that Shawcross Shawcross for sure had this disorder. Uh, He also stated that some pyrroles have chemical similarities to LSD and that Shawcross, you know, had around 10 times the average slash normal amount in his bloodstream. Dr. Krauss believed that because of this, Shawcross couldn't regulate his mood, was prone to impulsive violence, and had an inability to separate fantasy from reality oftentimes, uh, more so when he was stressed. And thus, when you add him dealing with this abnormality in addition to uh, other abnormalities, you know, he should have been found not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, Dr. Krauss also pointed to something called Jacob's syndrome in regards to Shawcross uh, being genetically predisposed towards murder. Shawcross was diagnosed with Jacob's syndrome or XYY syndrome, also sometimes called 47,XXY syndrome or Kleinfelter syndrome. And due to it maybe being overly associated with criminality around the time of Shawcross's trial, it was once called criminal syndrome. And this syndrome has other names. Uh, I feel like it's in the running for the title of syndrome with the most fucking names of any syndrome in the world. Uh, The syndrome was first named for Patricia Jacobs, a Scottish geneticist. Jacobs studied 315 men incarcerated at a mental hospital, which was considered the first research on the subject. And her study led to the assumption that men with 47XYY syndrome uh, are aggressive and violent. But subsequent studies of the general population, you know, did not duplicate Jacob's original findings. Uh, this genetic disorder that no one can seem to agree on uh, what to call is uh, pretty common, affecting one in every 1,000 live male births. And by male births, I mean one out of every 1,000 dudes is born with it, not one out of every 1,000 dudes who gives birth to a Klinefelter syndrome baby through their fucking pee hole or butt or something. Pretty sure, you know, everyone knows that, but I did weird it wordly. Uh, the primary feature of this syndrome is infertility and small, weak balls, or to use the proper terminology, small, poorly functioning testicles. I think this syndrome needs another name, maybe uh, STN syndrome, maybe sad, tiny nuts syndrome. Uh, not all men with these sad, tiny nuts are sterile. Uh, Shawcross fathered at least two kids, or at least thought he did. So he didn't seem to have been shooting blanks. Uh, often the symptoms of the syndrome are subtle. Subjects don't even realize they have it. You know, they just think they got some, some sad, tiny balls. Or maybe their, maybe their balls aren't uh, that tiny all the time. It varies. Other symptoms can include weaker muscles, greater height, poor motor coordination, less body hair, breast growth, less interest in sex. Uh, Shawcross did not seem to exhibit any of those symptoms. Intelligence, usually normal, but reading difficulties, problems of speech, pretty common. He did suffer from learning disabilities. Not a good student at all. Uh, like really struggled with his reading and arithmetic. Had trouble speaking normally as, as he uh, grew up. And as I alluded to, there was a theory that this syndrome caused aggressive behavior. Uh, It was once known also as superhuman, or I'm sorry, Superman syndrome. Yet another fucking nickname. I I still like sad, tiny nuts uh, syndrome the best. Um, While most doctors now don't seem to think an extra chromosome turned Shawcross into a killer, there would be a lot more serial killers if this uh, very common syndrome was, you know, more powerfully linked to violence. He did seem to be suffering from a variety of other shit he may have been born with. 
Dr. Todd Grande, YouTuber, who's also a licensed professional counselor of mental health, licensed chemical dependency professional, has a PhD in counselor education and supervision, loved to dissect the minds of serial killers. He recently speculated about Arthur Shawcross's brain activity and concluded that Arthur likely had a severe case of antisocial personality disorder and that he was also a clinical narcissist and a clinical psychopath. Uh, not currently known how much genetics play a uh, you know, part in developing these conditions, but it's believed that genetic factors you know, definitely do play a part. Uh, in regards to antisocial personality disorder, Arthur showed signs of all seven criteria. One, criminality. Two, pathological line. Three, impulsivity. Four, aggression. Five, disregard for safety. Six, irresponsibility. And seven, lack of remorse. Antisocial personality disorder is a cluster B personality disorder in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And out of these seven symptom criteria, only three are required for diagnosis. And this dude hit all seven, aced it, aced his uh, antisocial test. Uh, Dr. Grande thinks several serious head injuries Arthur suffered as a child and and as as an adolescent led to the development of this disorder and an overall increase in violence and impulsivity and a cognitive inability to regulate morality. We'll get into these injuries in today's timeline, but Shawcross had his bell rung hard, so fucking hard, on several different occasions. Dude got knocked out by a fucking sledgehammer at one point. Uh, Dr. Adrian Rain, clinical neuroscientist at USC, compared Shawcross's brain to Andre Chikatilo's. What does big deal? We're both smart guy with big brain and stuff. But for real, they had the same frontal lobe abnormality. Both suffered a lot with impotence as well and with rage partially triggered by impotence. Uh, the extreme violence Shawcross exhibited, cutting people's bodies open, cutting pieces off, eating pieces. Dr. Rain says in cases like that, brain damage, frontal lobe abnormalities, usually part of the problem. Rain says the prefrontal cortex sits right above your eyes and just behind your forehead, right? In animals, only three or 4% of the brain consists of prefrontal cortex, but in the human brain is 29%. The prefrontal cortex is, in our brain is a bit like the guardian angel of our behavior. It's really what makes us human, and it allows us to live and function in human societies without being aggressive. Stops us doing antisocial, aggressive, outrageous acts. We've always had the idea that perhaps damage to the frontal lobe region of the brain may be involved in violent behavior and in creating psychopathic personality. Makes sense to me. right? The prefrontal cortex acts as a controlling mechanism for the basic human emotions of anger and aggression, which emit from the limbic system further back in the brain. Looking at brain scans, comparing normal people's brains to the brains of killers like Shawcross, there is way less frontal lobe activity in the brains of the killers. So Shawcross may have truly had a hard time on a fundamental level, you know, to control impulsive feelings of aggression and anger. Combine that with an inability to differentiate between reality and fantasy in some situations, you know, you get a fucking monster disguised as a man. Dr. Grande said Arthur showed signs of conduct disorder before the age of 15, which lines up with antisocial personality disorder. Also lived a parasitic lifestyle, had a lack of long-term goals, strong predilection for thrill-seeking. His behavior also lined up with primary and secondary uh, psychopathy. In regards to being a psychopath, he exhibited a consistent failure to accept responsibility, pathological lying, oh man, that dude loved to lie, and lack of empathy. Yeah, lying such a big one with Arthur. It seemed like he lied pretty much every time he talked. Uh, he likely lied about a lot of his childhood experiences, or at least greatly exaggerated them. Most of the childhood experiences we'll go over today are the accounts of others who knew him, not accounts that he gave. Uh, He made up lies to rationalize killing his victims. He said that one victim tried to steal his wallet. Uh, Another wouldn't stop talking. Uh, One attacked him. You know, uh, a few made fun of him. And so, you know, he had to kill him. He said shit like that in interviews as if the person he was talking to would then understand that he had no choice. He did the right thing. Um at least concerning his uh, adult victims. Uh, He did refuse, interestingly, to ever discuss the two kids he killed with any interviewers. Uh, He would actually walk out of interviewers if they would ask him questions about these kids. Uh, Dr. Grande thinks a lot of the line Arthur did lines up with something called vulnerable narcissism. Arthur didn't want to be judged as a typical serial killer. He wanted to be seen as someone who was justified in what they did. He exhibited emotions of uh, both shame over killing the kids and what seems like pride in killing the women. Narcissistic personality disorder, a cluster B personality disorder, uh, nine symptom criteria, five of which are required for diagnosis. And that's grandiose sense of self-importance, fantasies, special or unique, uh, requires excessive admiration, uh, sense of entitlement, manipulative, lacks empathy for others, often envious, arrogant attitudes or behaviors. Uh, Shawcross exhibited all nine of these narcissistic traits. 
He wasn't fucking around when it came to mental illness. He, he didn't just dip his toes in that pool. He went hard in the paint on that shit. And here's a better explanation of vulnerable narcissism. There's two types of narcissism. With grandiose narcissism, we see characteristics like being extroverted, socially bold, self-confident, having a superficial charm. I think of Christian Bale in American Psycho, you know, uh, being resistant to criticism, being callous and unemotional. Vulnerable narcissism is characterized by shame, anger, aggression, hypersensitivity, tendency to be introverted, defensive, avoidant, anxious, depressed, uh, socially awkward, and shy, which uh, fits, uh, you know, Shawcross. Dr. Grande also thought Arthur was a, a psychopath primary and secondary, you know, as I said, Uh, factor one, psychopathy, the primary kind defined by being callous and unemotional, manipulative, pathological liar, fearless dominance, lacking remorse, check, 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 check. Factor two, psychopathy, secondary kind uh, defined by impulsivity, irresponsibility, being neurotic, emotionally reactive, engaging in criminal behavior, extreme sensation seeking, check, 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 check. Dude aced his disorders. Uh, A psychopathic narcissist with anti-personality disorder who was born with an extra Y chromosome had consistently elevated levels of pyrroles in his blood, uh, got knocked unconscious growing up with a fucking sledgehammer amongst other serious head injuries, may have also been physically and sexually abused, definitely emotionally abused, uh, emotionally neglected, severely bullied by other kids at school. You know, he had a lot fucking going on. All those factors seem to have combined in Shawcross to turn him into a very violent man. A 1993 study of more than 60 serial killers found that psychological and physical abuse were a pervasive characteristic of their childhoods. 1997 study found that a group of 62 male serial killers, uh, 48% had experienced rejection from a parent or important adult in their lives. Another study found that adults who were physically, sexually, and emotionally abused, three times more likely to commit violent crimes as adults. Humiliation and narcissistic injury, threats to self-esteem, early in life were identified as contributing factors based on three additional studies. Study found a relationship between head injuries and serial killers of 239 subjects. 51 had a definite or strongly suspected type of head injury, strongly suspected being, you know, no medical records, but, you know, suspected loss of consciousness. Okay. As we now explore a timeline of Arthur Shawcross's life, I wonder, did this dude ever have a chance by the time he made it into early adulthood of not becoming a monster? I'm not sure he did. I think he was a ticking time bomb. Maybe someday we'll be able to repair brains broken as badly as his was, take someone destined for extreme violence, be able to truly rehabilitate them. I hope so. Being able to heal a mind like Shawcross is the way we can now, say, repair a crushed or slipped spinal disc. That for sure would prevent a lot of people from future horrific abuse and death. In the meantime, in the interest of public safety, we need to either lock these motherfuckers away forever and throw away the key or put them in the dirt. Now that we know a little bit about the uh, problems he may have had with his brain, Let's look into the problems he caused in his life in today's Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck timeline. June 6, 1945. Arthur John Shawcross, born at the U.S. Naval Hospital in Kittery, Maine. The doctor who delivered him forgot to wear his glasses that day. Or take his mood stabilizers, apparently, and instead of patting him on the back or bottom to get some water out of his lungs, uh, he balled up his fist and he just fucking punched that little fucker repeatedly in the head. Uh, The first of a series of so many head wounds. And of course, that's crazy talk, but if that would have happened, uh, it would have been par for the course with this guy. A lot of crazy head wounds coming up. Uh, Kittery actually Maine's first incorporated town, established in 1647. Did not know that before this week. English settlers moved to the area way back in 1623. Those settlers worked as hunters, trappers, timber workers, sailors. The uh, Wabanaki-affiliated tribes who lived in the area called the town of uh, Amaskeeg, which in Algonquin uh, dialect translates to fishing point. And Kittery became part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1652, and the city served as a center of trading and shipbuilding. One notable early citizen was General William Whipple. Fuck you and fuck your family! Drink Whipple! I feel like I have to at least hit that button when someone named Whipple shows up randomly in an episode. Uh, This Whipple was born in 1730, seaman, uh, soldier, signer of the Declaration of Independence. The Portsmouth Naval Shipyard was established in Kittery in 1800, although Portsmouth is in New Hampshire. Their shipyard is in Kittery, which is just across the border, and it's the oldest continuously serving Navy yard in the U.S. Today, Kittery is a popular tourist spot with lots of outlet stores and restaurants, and when Shawcross was born there, the population was roughly 5,300 people. Arthur's parents were Arthur Roy and Bessie Shawcross. Uh, Bessie preferred to be called Betty. 
And despite all the genetic problems their son Arthur John would have, there doesn't seem to be a history of obvious mental illness in the family tree. And historians have checked. Arthur John really seemed to be uh, an anomaly. Extreme example of the classic black sheep of the family. Uh, Prior to his great-grandfather, David Shawcross, uh, who moved from Britain to Canada to the U.S., Arthur's family tree traces mostly back to the U.K. One ancestor was a former attorney general of Great Britain. Uh, A distant cousin was the chief British prosecutor of the Nuremberg Trials. Prior to Arthur's father, uh, who did do at least one possibly very fucked up thing, the only scandal anyone seems to be able to find in the family tree is that his paternal grandfather, Fred, married a 15-year-old girl named Muriel Blake when he was 21 against her family's wishes. Muriel's parents called the police. Fred was thrown in jail, but just two days later, he was out, and then the pair almost immediately got married and stayed married for 49 years until Muriel passed away, and then Fred would follow her to the grave just three years later. So, you know, not really much of a scandal. Uh, Fred and Muriel had four children. One of them was our subject's father, Arthur Roy. And although he never went to jail over it, Arthur Roy seemed to have had a much bigger marriage scandal than his father did. Arthur Roy dropped out of school in the eighth grade, not terribly uncommon for the time. Uh, Applied for a job at the Jefferson County Highway Department, became their youngest employee. Then he enlisted in the Marines after the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor. He'd served honorably in World War II with an artillery regiment of the 1st Marine Division where he'd earned four battle stars. And he'd also get married. An article from the Watertown Daily Times in 1944 will report that he married Thelma June, an Australian woman, on June 14, 1943. Here's what it said. In February 1943, after cleaning up the Guadalcanal, Shawcross and his buddies were sent to Australia for arrest. While in Australia, Private Shawcross attended a Marine Station dance, and there he met there he met Miss Thelma June of Ye, Australia. On June 14, 1943, the couple was married in Australia. They have one child, three months old, named Harley Roy Shawcross. Mrs. Shawcross is in Australia, residing with her parents. She will remain in Australia until the war is over. Uh, This reminds me of the recent Hell's Angels Suck, where we dived into the history of Harley Davidsons and learned that their popularity in America can be traced back to servicemen in World War II riding them, loving them, buying them after the war. I have to wonder if Harley was named after his dad's motorcycle. Also, love that there's a little town in Australia named Yay! Uh, When Arthur Roy returns home from the war, he does not bring his new family with him, and no one seems to know why. Arthur Roy certainly never publicly said. He'll keep this secret from everyone, including his family, for many years. Uh, Art Sr., furloughed in July of 1944 after his furlough. He's transferred to guard duty at the Naval Hospital in Portsmouth, right near Kittery. Here he catches the attention of Bessie Yerix, a.k.a. Betty. Uh, Betty had been a factory worker since she dropped out of high school in the 10th grade. She was originally from nearby Summersworth, New Hampshire, just uh, over 50 miles north. Worked as a pipe fitter's helper at the Navy Yard. She and Arthur fell in love, got married November 23rd, 1944. Uh, Arthur was 21. Betty was 18. When their first child is born seven months later, Arthur John Shawcross. Arthur Roy. Uh, sounds like that dude was not a fan of condoms or pulling out. His sperm seemed to have swam real well. Uh, I wonder if his first wife in Australia was still waiting for him to bring her to America when he got married again. Wish I knew more about Arthur Roy's first family. Uh, did he just ghost Thelma? What a fucked up thing to do to someone if that was the case. To just completely abandon them. Or did she dump him and just, uh, you know, he chose not to talk about her? No idea. But Arthur Roy's new wife, Betty, uh, will learn about Thelma years later and will not be happy. Uh, Betty was a small but domineering woman. She made uh, sure that her house was always clean, ran a tight ship. Her son, Arthur John, always said he loved his mother, but also seemed nervous around her according to various accounts. He has a very interesting relationship with his mom. Uh, Betty was apparently intimidating to a lot of people she met. She was loud, apparently had a vocabulary that would make a sailor blush. She also, according to various people who seemed to have known her well, was a good mom and a good person. When Art Sr. left the military, he worked as a county road worker and heavy equipment operator. He was known for always being calm and subdued compared to his wife. On June 19th, 1945, Betty decided to take her young son to her sister-in-law's home in Watertown, New York, until her husband finished his service. According to Betty, Junior was born two months premature. It wasn't really Junior, different names, but you know, you you get it. And only weighed five pounds. And he seemed to have been an odd child right from the start. One unnamed relative would uh, later recall about Artie's early childhood. I love this quote. Artie was a weird little bastard from the time he learned to walk. Fucking nailed it. Uh, Another cousin would later remember, uh, or a cousin. He had brown hair and big, beautiful, dark eyes, but his baby pictures didn't look quite normal. Most babies are smiling or in tears because they're aware of the photographer. Artie had a blank look, straight ahead, no expression. Something else odd about him, he almost never cried, but when he did, one eye stayed dry. So signs of cognitive abnormalities perhaps right from the very start. 
Years later, psychologists will note that the adult Arthur Shawcross's facial expressions show a lack of effect or inappropriate effect. Uh, despite many, uh, you know, early indicators that Arthur was different, he also overall seemed to be developing pretty normally during his early years. He was breastfed for about two months, spoke his first word at nine months, walked six months later, uh, was weaned from the bottle at a year and a half. In, early, in an early school interview, his mom reported that he caused no problems as a baby. Uh, the family lived in cramp, cramped quarters the first few years of Arthur John's life. While his dad resumed some pre-war work he'd done with the highway department and began building a small wood frame home on an acre of land six miles northwest of Watertown, New York, land donated by his father, Fred. Uh, Watertown was named after the, uh, the falls of the nearby Black River. The town developed in the early 1800s as an industrial and manufacturing center. Uh, Watertown is the original place of the five and dime store, the safety pin, and Little Trees Air Fresheners for random trivia. Uh, pretty impressive for a small city of only around 25,000 people, around 35,000 when Arthur grew up there. Yes, uh, another dwindling population, another Rust Belt casualty. Uh, similar origin as Rochester. Pioneers settled the town in 1800. They saw the city as a potential industrial center with a river to harness for power, had waterfalls. Watertown became home to a number of paper mills and steam engine factories. 1958, the Shawcross family would permanently move to this home in, near Watertown, uh, a small town near uh, Lake Ontario, New York State. Technically, their new home would lay inside the city limits of Brownville, a town right next to Watertown of a little over 6,000 people now, uh, a little under 4,000 when the Shawcross family moved there. Uh, actually, a lot of Shawcrosses would live there already when Arthur Roy and his brood moved in. The area around Arthur John's childhood home was known as Shawcross Corner due to the number of Shawcrosses that lived on what used to be Fred and Muriel's land. Four different Shawcross families, at one point, 13 out of 15 of Fred and Muriel's grandchildren all lived on the same acreage. And actually, they lived there for a time with them all as well. A uh, young Arthur had lots of cousins to play with growing up, but didn't seem to do that much. Never really seemed to fit in. Always the odd man out. Fucking truly odd man. Uh, he'd grow up a loner, despite later getting married four times. He would stay a loner pretty much his whole life. He also would have uh, three siblings in Watertown to not play with. Jeannie, James, and Donna. Donna was born a, a year after Arthur. Jeannie was born, you know, two years after he was. James, better known as Jimmy. Baby of the family, age is never listed. Probably born a year after Jeannie. Arthur Roy was potent. He could apparently just look at you and get you pregnant. Uh, Betty was the one who kept Arthur and his little brother and little sisters in line. You know, the homemaker, the disciplinarian. Often hit her kids with the belt when they misbehaved. That might sound extreme today, but pretty common for the time. Ex-Marine Arthur Roy apparently was not a disciplinarian. Uh, Shawcross will later make wild claims of physical and sexual abuse, mainly just out of the hands of his mother. That will be backed up by absolutely no one who wasn't on his defense team. Uh, according to one of Arthur's wives, Linda Neary, the Shawcrosses were especially distant from all their children emotionally. Uh, they almost never touched or hugged them. Uh, but that's, you know, also not atypical for the times. Linda claimed that Arthur Roy and Betty had an especially rocky re relationship with Arthur, who they called Artie and that he was treated differently than his other siblings. She said that Betty told her once that Arthur was, quote, the bane of her life. And I know that sounds like a fucked up thing to say about your kid, but Arthur does sound like in this story that he probably was the bane of her life. Like he was a fucking gigantic pain in the ass from an early time. Like I would feel terrible for any of my friends if they had a kid like this motherfucker. Uh, he truly did seem to be the bane of a lot of people's existence. It's like he should have never been born. He should have been miscarried, but nature fucked up and somehow the monster still came out. Uh, one person listed as a close relative in the best book we found on Shawcross, The Misbegotten Son, A Serial Killer and His Victims, the true story of Arthur J. Shawcross by Jack Olson and Catherine Ramsland, said, I can just imagine what his mother and father went through at home. I remember when they were putting an addition on their house and already stole the lumber and shingles to build a fort. He lined the walls with crushed velour that his mother had brought back from a visit to New Hampshire. He didn't understand why anyone was upset. He said, I was just trying to build a fort. There were a lot of incidents like that. Artie just didn't get it. So many similar accounts from Arthur's childhood of people saying he was just fucking weird, odd. So many people talking about how he basically just did not understand how life worked on any level. He could not read between the lines, could not get the gist of what people were talking about, couldn't pick up on sarcasm, irony, none of that. Dude really seemed to march to the beat of his own drum, like so many of these serial killers, march to the beat of a crazy, especially fucked up drum. According to another cousin, Nancy McBride, Betty never paid much attention to Art and wasn't loving with him. But how much that was her and how much that was him. I mean, maybe he creeped her the fuck out. When he was a kid, you know, if he was anything like he would later become, he would creep me the fuck out. 
Arthur would later speak often of having a difficult relationship with his parents and siblings, especially mom. He called his mom domineering, would go on to claim she was the source of most of his problems. Uh, More on his wilder claims regarding Betty here soon. 1950, at the age of five, Arthur enrolls in kindergarten, where he will have a perfect attendance record and seem to complete his work just fine there. However, his teachers and peers do note that he frequently regresses into speaking and baby talk. Uh, his family will later say that he frequently wet the bed, had nightmares concerning uh, considering what we know about him now. But, you know, overall, not really that big of a deal for that age, other than the, you know, combo suggests he was struggling psycho- uh, psychologically, perhaps. His bed wetting and baby talking will last all the way into his teen years. That's not as typical. And again, you know, uh, probably indicates that he was struggling mentally, which uh, he did seem to be. We just don't know for sure why he was struggling. Was it because of mostly genetic factors? Uh, was it environmental? Shitty home life? Some combination of the two? I feel like it was mostly genetic with him. Uh, Arthur also invented imaginary friends, talked to them in strange voices while in kindergarten and early grade school. The other kids in class teased Arthur beginning in kindergarten, started calling him Audie. Audie, amongst, I'm sure, other less favorable names. Audie seemed to be the main one, though, and it pissed him off. Sent him into fits of rage. And, uh, you know, pretty fitting for this dude. Not saying it was cool for the other kids to call him this, but holy shit, was he an odd duck. He was teased, bullied frequently at school, despite having a shit ton of cousins at the same school with him who did not stick up for him. I'm guessing when other kids called him Audie, they probably thought some version of, (laughs) yeah, fucking nailed it. Uh, Many of them would later say as much growing up that Arthur, you know, creeped them out or downright scared them. There's one story about some cousins seeing him walking home with a stick resting over his shoulders at one point growing up. At the end of the stick, right, like a little hobo stick, like he's going on the train tracks. But at the end of the stick, instead of like a little, uh, you know, handkerchief with, you know, uh, food and stuff in it, he had a snapping turtle that he, that he had found and he had shish kebobbed. He ran a stick through this poor turtle's ass, came out through the creature's mouth, guessing it was alive when he did that. Uh, and he walked home carrying it over his shoulder like that was just a normal thing to do. People freaked out. He just seemed surprised. Uh, another time after getting into some kind of argument with the cousin, they saw him in a tree pointing a 22 rifle at their father who was mowing his lawn nearby. And when they confronted him about it later, he told him that he could have easily killed their dad, said he could kill him like shooting fish in a barrel. Basically, everyone interviewed about what he was like as a kid relayed some basic message of, yeah, he was disturbed. Uh, Arthur got good grades during the first few years of school, but also a loner, didn't make any friends. He would often sit inside at recess while the other kids played outside. He tried to make friends by doing favors, giving out candy. Uh, other kids would just, you know, take his candy, whatever things, but then just continue teasing him. The fucking kids, man. Uh, they seem to be a little nicer now due to teachers, you know, keeping a closer eye on shit like that, less societal tolerance for bullying. Historically, pretty fucking brutal towards anyone they consider to be a weirdo. Uh, instead of getting back at his bullies, at some point early in grade school, he becomes a bully. He starts picking on the younger kids until they cry, uh, and he will remain a bully like this, it seems, for the rest of his life. 1953, Arthur's in third grade, and his behavior and grades suddenly begin to suffer. A psych test now ordered by his teachers reveals that his, you know, poor behavior is based on feelings of inadequacy, rejection, hostility directed at his parents, lower than average IQ, and some non-specific learning disabilities. Once he made it to third grade, he just couldn't keep up with his peers anymore. Uh, He would never be able to keep up again. One cousin referencing how, you know, Arthur, Arthur just wasn't a real bright kid, talked about how he took everything literally. Like if he told him the cow jumped over the moon, he would actually look up into the sky and try and find the cow. Uh, with no sense of humor about it. Arts teachers also noticed in grade school that he had a complicated relationship with his mom, Betty. You know, loved her, tried to get her attention with gifts, according to some of them, uh, but she just didn't seem to care. Arthur's family blamed the school for his behavior. The school seemed to blame mostly Betty. Arthur would repeat the third grade. Then he would also take two years to pass the fourth grade as well. His additional struggle at school did seem to coincide with some extra struggles at home when he was nine, when he was in third grade, the first time around. His mom, Betty, found out that, uh, you know, his dad, Art Sr., had that other wife and son in Australia. Some of Betty's relatives noted that she became a different woman after that, an angrier person. She became jealous, would sometimes fly into fits of rage. And that, you know, dad, Arthur Roy, became quiet and withdrawn. So shit is tense at home now. Young Arthur responds by starting to run away, usually just over to his grandma's house, but sometimes he'd make it out of the area completely once, uh, apparently, he made it all the way to uh, Canada. Or so he said, which is, you know, questionable. Uh, he'd already started to develop a temper by the time he's in third grade. And when things, you know, get volatile at home, it becomes, you know, an explosive temper. Echoes of Ed Kemper's, mother, why? Why do I feel such rage inside of me? Arthur will claim that uh, in addition to finding out that his dad forgot to mention he already had a family when he married his mom and mom was totally not cool about it. Uh, all sorts of extra wild shit starts happening at home. He claimed he was now being physically and sexually abused by family members. 
Uh, Betty Shawcross will later vehemently deny these allegations, saying her strange son had a perfectly normal childhood. And all the events he spoke about were a product of his overactive imagination, you know, combined with brain damage. Her take on the abuse, maybe or probably not happening, is supported by the fact that Shawcross did suffer brain damage growing up and was known to be a notorious liar by the time he made these confessions after his arrest for multiple murders. And in subsequent years, he would frequently change his stories uh, about all this just about every time he was asked. Regardless, let's go over some of the claims uh, she refuted. He didn't always lie, so who knows? Uh, By the age of seven, Arthur said he was already frequently masturbating and engaging in oral sex with girls around his own age. When he was nine, he said his aunt uh, Tina allegedly molested him, forced him to perform oral sex on her. Uh, He was real interested in oral sex. He had developed a real unhealthy fixation on cunnilingus, the stimulation of the female genitals with the lips or tongue, you know, again, oral sex, uh, in the sense that it'll be combined with a lot of the violence he'll inflict on women later once he starts killing in Rochester. Uh, He'll later go real heavy on the teeth. Instead of using his uh, lips and tongue, his, uh, his oral technique when going down on the ladies left a, a lot to be desired. Art claimed he had his first homosexual encounter at age 11. He said a man picked him up in a red convertible. Uh, he said the man held him by the throat, performed oral sex on him. Always oral sex with this guy. And that the man uh, then anally raped him, dropped him off uh, you know, near his house. Arthur said that you know, after this incident, he could no longer reach orgasm without hurting himself. Also said around this time, he began sexually experimenting with animals. He would tell various uh, interviewers, psychiatrists, investigators, etc., whoever who would listen, uh, that growing up, he had sex with uh, sheep, uh, cows, a horse, uh, even once accidentally killed a chicken while trying to have sex with a chicken. And I hope for the sake of those poor animals, uh, he was making that shit up for shock value. Because he did seem to really enjoy shocking the people who interviewed him, especially ladies. Uh, also, I don't think, uh, you know, this is the first time we've come across someone claiming to say they, uh, saying that they fucked a chicken growing up. I just can't, I can't figure out who it was. I thought it was Henry Lee Lucas, but it's not in the notes. Why chicken? Such a small animal. You know, and it has those feet that look like they can just real, really claw you up. How, how does anyone ever think that putting your dick near or in a chicken is going to work out on any level? Oh, wait, I know. They're fucking crazy when they're severely mentally ill. That's how that works. Well, also, if he's telling the truth, not the first time we've come across a cow fucker, right? German serial killer, Joachim Kroll, uh, loved cows. I mean, really, really loved them. Oh, yeah, I was a, a sexy car lover. I wish I could have met uh, Mr. Shawcross and gone on some farm tours, uh, you know, together or something. Maybe open up a, a petting zoo together. Uh, maybe maybe petting zoo during the day, uh, a petting brothel zoo at, at the night, yeah? Uh, Arthur also claimed that he had a sexual relationship with his sister Jeannie when he was 14 and she was 12. Jeannie, like her mom, would uh, aggressively deny these allegations, be infuriated by them. Arthur also claimed to have a sexual relationship with a cousin named Linda. Uh, Linda did not deny this. Uh, she went on record many times saying that not only did they have sex, but that the sex was amazing. Mind-blowing. Best sex she'd ever had and that if she had one wish, you know, when she was interviewed towards the end of her life, it would be to bring Shawcross back from the dead so he could make sweet, sweet love to her one last time. Uh, before he died, she would visit Shawcross in prison for conjugals as often as it was allowed until officials found out they were closely related and put a stop to it. And even then, you know, they weren't mad at her. They got it. Many of them had also fucked him. Or been fucked by him, you know? Numerous officials would eventually lose their jobs for, you know, uh, having Arthur go down on them or go, go down on Arthur Studmuff and Shawcross. They said in addition to just being a really, really good looking guy, he had a powerful sexual magnetism about him. Uh, I'm kidding, of course. He's probably the least attractive serial killer we've ever looked at. Uh, he's definitely in the running. Even Albert Fish and Yahim Kroll would have fucking destroyed this dude in a beauty pageant. That's, that's saying a lot. And I only feel comfortable saying something that mean because of how shitty of a person he became, you know, just how heinous his crimes were. Uh, Cousin Linda, of course, did not back up Arthur's claims of fuckery. Uh, Arthur told psychologists, his attorneys, reporters, that his mom performed uh, performed oral sex on him for years, uh, that he performed oral sex on her for years as well. Again, you know, dude spent a lot of time talking about all the pussies he ate. Uh, Real unfortunately, he will also later talk about literally eating some of these pussies. Uh, When he was 14, he said mom had intercourse with him and that that freaked him out. Right. Uh, Then he ran away all the way to Canada. I don't know that that happened. Uh, Also claimed that at some point his mom uh, sodomized him with a broomstick. That particular claim highly doubted by numerous psychiatrists, fellow true crime junkies, people familiar with the case, because there's no medical records associated with that kind of physical trauma. Uh, You know, the the kind of trauma that being sodomized with a broomstick would entail. Uh, I don't believe this claim. However, I guess it is possible. I wasn't there. And I guess the kind of parent who would sodomize you with a broomstick is probably not the kind of parent who's going to take you to a doctor. If you experience, you know, severe rectal, te- rectal tearing and bleeding afterwards. Uh, Betty would actually call the prosecutor during Arthur's trial in Rochester and ask, why is Art saying these things? 
Yeah, really upset her. She was embarrassed, insisted it was all lies. Addressing why she would ever do that, Art uh, said in a 2008 interview, well, can you picture what would happen to a person if she admitted she did the shit like that to me? In response to accusation that he was lying, he said, how do, how do they know? I know because I was there. I know what I had to go through. I don't have medical records. You know, I didn't have them when my mom was abusing me. You think my mom took me to a doctor when she was giving me oral sex? That's bullshit. And again, if this was somebody different, a different case, you know, I would give more credence to what he's saying, but no part of me believes any of these stories with Art. Uh, later in life, Arthur would say that because of all this, he developed difficulty with uh, maintaining an erection and reaching orgasm, which is why he preferred giving oral sex to women over intercourse. Okay, all of his sexual abuse claims now address. Let's return to things that didn't maybe kind of possibly happen uh, and return to things that, you know, either definitely or at least probably happened. Backing up to when he was in third grade, there's another reason his behavior might have suddenly and significantly worsened and has nothing to do with his dad or any other family member. Uh, one source stated that around this age, he got hit in the head with a rock hard enough for him to lose consciousness. Doesn't say who threw it, only that he took a rock to the head and that it knocked him the fuck out. Uh, this claim uh, doesn't seem to be backed up by any medical records, but others will be, you know, other similar claims of head injuries. Moving into later grade school and junior high, he starts to steal. She likes sodas, ice cream, radios, lots of shoplifting. Uh, he became sexually aroused by fire. You know, so that's not scary or anything. He becomes defiant at home, refuses to do his chores, starts getting in trouble for fighting at school. Uh, moving into his teen years, Art is still wet in the bed, having nightmares. And, in, uh, you know, instead of the baby talk, he's, he's uh, talking in strange, high-pitched voices. For a time, he liked to walk around outside chanting, die, 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 over and over. He's throwing wild temper tantrums at school. Other kids have moved on from Audi. Now they're mostly calling him crazy boy. A uh, girlfriend he had his teen said he told her one day that he'd be go out in the woods to kind of get away from it all. He'd be all full of rage, you know, angry at people teasing him. And then he would still hear voices out in the trees, you know, pe- voices coming from places, you know, who knows where he couldn't find anybody. Uh, this dude was really not stable. One cousin, Nancy McBride Baker, said that by the time he's in his teens, she and a lot of the other kids who lived near him were afraid of him. She said that her brother Ron once had a, uh, or her brother Ron once said that a fort Art made looked dumb. So he said, oh, it looks dumb. Art got so mad, he grabbed a fucking block of ice, smashed Ron in the head with it, that he pounced on him, started hitting him over and over until she and some other family members, you know, were able to pull him off. She said her mom said sooner or later, he's going to kill somebody. Then one day he almost killed her. She lived next door. And one night she snuck out to meet up with her boyfriend when the sun went down. Arthur must've been, you know, watching for her or something because he was hiding outside his house when this happened, when she walked past, he pops out from around the corner, hits her in the legs with a baseball bat, drops her to the ground. She falls, uh, her boyfriend, you know, runs over, starts to run over to find Arthur now standing above her laughing, saying, I'm going to chop your head off. He grabbed an ax that he had. Uh, her boyfriend ripped the ax handle out of his hand and then beat his ass. She never played with him again after that, I bet not. And then she was on the lookout around her house for the rest of her fucking childhood for this dude. Said one day Arthur showed up at her apartment in Watertown nine years later and she pretended not to be home. Still terrified. Still worried he was going to try and kill her. It was a menace. Uh, when he wasn't trying to kill a cousin, he was uh, definitely killing animals. He was known to snap rabbits' necks, uh, put bats in family members' cars, tie cats together, throw them over clotheslines, uh, hit squirrels with bats, drown cats, rip the feathers off of baby birds. Uh, he would shoot darts at frogs that he had caught and then nailed to a fucking dartboard. Another cousin, Linda Cobb, would tell reporters after Arthur was arrested for murder that she watched him numerous times skin fish that were still alive. He would try and keep them alive as he's skinning them because he wanted to see how long it would take him to die. Said he seemed to have taken a lot of pleasure in doing shit like that. Uh, one day, a neighbor kid remembered him carrying a burlap sack to a nearby lake this kid was fishing at. He said, uh, who says can't, cats can't swim? That he took a kitten out of the bag, tossed it out into the water. When the cat swam to shore, he grabbed it, heaved it farther back out into the lake. After three or four throws, this other boy turned away and left. He said, I knew what was going to happen. What the fuck? Dude, it was a psychopath. When you see how he looked and combine it with all these stories, it, it, it's like he was a bad guy in an 80s slasher flick. Like, like a young, he's like the origin story. You know, the, the, like a young Jason Voorhees, young Michael Myers, but maybe dumber, probably dumber. Uh, when looking into his childhood, we're watching the origin story of a monster in a B horror movie franchise. 1961, artist 16. He's also still in the eighth grade. He's the tallest kid in class. He's shaving now. He's described as having broad, powerful shoulders that slope down at an odd angle that combined with his recessed eyes and furrowed brow made him look like a fucking monkey or an ape or something. Visually, at any age, again, just doesn't look right. Referencing one of my own old stand-up jokes, he looked visually insane, like you could diagnose serious mental illness off of any picture ever taken of him. He now joins the wrestling team. Of course he does. <laughs> he's much older than the other kids, and he loves violence. 
Uh, he was apparently too violent to be a good wrestler, though. Uh, too much violence, not enough brains, not enough self-control. His former teammate, Jim Robbins, later recalled wrestling with him in the 145 to 154 pound class, saying he had a lot of natural talent and he was as hard as an anvil, but he couldn't concentrate. He was always too mad. You don't wrestle from anger. He'd forget his holds and use sheer strength. Or he'd try the TV crap, body slams, airplane spins. <laughs> I fucking love he tried airplane spins, flying mares. If he lost, he went nuts. I saw him throw a chair at a guy that pinned him. If he won, he'd keep beating on the guy till he was pulled off. He slammed one opponent across his knee and threw another one into the seats. Coach would yell, no, shot cross, no. Sometimes you, <laughs> this guy was such a fucking menace. Sometimes he was disqualified. He'd throw punches till his face was red and the veins stuck out. God, I wish there was just footage, you know, somewhere uh, from, his, from his old matches of these kind of wrestling matches. Friday night at the Watertown Junior High Auditorium and Multi-Purpose Room, we have Arthur, Crazy Boy Shawcross, the killer from Kittery, the Brownville Bruiser, the Watertown Weirdo, taking on Tom, terrified average 13-year-old Anderson, normal 8th grader of a normal 8th grade age who doesn't drown cats, throw darts at frogs, or try and kill cousins. One is still waiting to go through puberty. The other has probably already beaten a hobo to death in the woods. Come on down to grab a free seat. You can have the whole seat, but you'll only need the edge. This guy was fucking out of control. Long before he killed anyone. Uh, Arthur also tried playing baseball. Football, uh, lacrosse, track. Didn't do well in any of these sports. Did, uh, according to some sources, get numerous head injuries. No one from his family ever came to watch him compete. Uh, they were probably just glad he wasn't home. Uh, while he never experienced any success athletically, uh, again though, let me at least reference one head injury, serious one that comes from numerous sources and it's just preposterous. Apparently one day at track practice, this dude took a fucking discus to the head. A discus. Sweet Jesus. It is crazy that he lived through that. God damn. Uh, too bad it didn't kill him, actually. It would have been so much better for the world. But I can't believe he's taking a rock and a discus now. Knocked him out cold, went to the hospital for this one. Uh, you know, bad concussion. I mean, he had to have had a skull fracture, but it doesn't say that. Uh, I don't know. 1962 at age 17, Arthur dropped out of school in the middle of ninth grade. He slunk in all of his classes. He wasn't going to pass, you know, uh, wasn't, he wasn't going to make it to the 10th grade. At the rate he was going, he would have graduated high school, I don't know, but sometime between 30 and 40 years old. Also, right before he dropped out, he challenged a popular teacher to a fight. And I guess the guy, <laughs> I guess the guy just beat his ass, just bounced him off a fucking wall. In front of his classmates. Um, so, you know, he's embarrassed. He's going to flunk. Uh, uh, with no school to at least keep him from running around town anymore, he quickly falls into a life of odd jobs and crime. He starts working random jobs, bailing hay, milking, hopefully not fucking cows, roofing. Uh, he works as a stock clerk. His primary interests, according to uh, an acquaintance years later, were stealing, starting fires, and sex. Uh, and he may have also become a peeping Tom. Here's something else creepy he was up to. Uh, spying on his mom and sisters. Some kids from his neighborhood years later would say that he drilled peepholes into the walls of his house. He supposedly showed these kids the holes that he drilled and would tell them stuff like, oh yeah, last night I you know, saw my parents having sex or I saw my sister naked, like that kind of shit. Someone should have taken this kid to the lake and just did to him what he did to that kitten, right? He was such a weirdo. Uh, his behavior continued to defy explanation. Uh, when he'd walk towards downtown Brownville, he was known for just like, <laughs> he, would, he would just like break into a crazy sprint for like 20, 30 yards, then walk again for 20, 30 yards, then sprint again like he was being chased by demons. He had all sorts of weird quirks. When he would get out of chair, he would, he would l grab his ass and pretend to lift himself out of the chair. Like, I guess no one ever thought this funny, but he just did it all the time, like for years. Couldn't pick up that no one liked this. He would go to dances and just whirl and spin around like a, a maniac, like he's having a seizure. Uh, an acquaintance later recalled, years before spazziness was in style, already danced spazzy. He was ahead of his time, he said sarcastically. This guy reminds me of a murderous version of a dude I went to high school with. A guy who was and still is very off. I don't know what the kid I, uh, I knew was eventually diagnosed with, but, you know, everybody knew that, you know, he had a lot of stuff he's dealing with. He ended up on, you know, disability from psychological problems because his brain has just never worked right. Shawcross, just never playing with the full deck. December 1963, now 18, Arthur receives his first probationary sentence for smashing the window of a local Sears uh, store in a robbery attempt. He got probation because he didn't actually steal anything. I guess he just kind of panicked once the window was smashed. Uh, <laughs> also, God damn, I, I actually forgot about this, the notes. Uh, while working one of his odd jobs, he takes a fucking sledgehammer to the head now. <laughs> ah, he gets knocked out for several hours and he's taken to the hospital. Oh my God, this is at least the third time that he's been knocked out cold. Rock, discus, sledgehammer. He's 18. 
It sounds like a fucked up version of rock, paper, scissors. Except in this one, when you lose, you get smashed in the head violently with the rock, discus, or sledgehammer. I, f- I feel like this episode is starting to come across like a, like a PSA. You know, some government program to get kids to be more aware of their surroundings so that they don't suffer numerous serious head injuries, maybe wear helmets all the time, so they don't turn into uh, uh, monsters, you know, like Shawcross. Hi. Is your child already a little odd? Do you want your kid to graduate from taking and talking to themselves to torturing small animals to death or to having sex with chickens? Do you want your child to try and cut their cousin's head off or to drill a peephole into your room? No? Then tell them to stick their head into their ass. The ass safety method, that is. Always wear a helmet, stay alert, stay aware. A S S. Don't pull your head out of your ass, stick it in your A S S. Always wear a helmet, stay alert, stay aware. Uh, September 1964, Arthur is uh, finally not living uh, by all of his family. I wonder if they threw a block party, celebrate not having this maniac constantly around them anymore. He marries his first wife. Somehow he's able to find someone to marry just with all this going on. Super lucky lady. Obviously high standard having uh, Sarah Chatterton. He's 19, she's 20. They've been dating less than a year. They met in the stock room of the Family Bargain Center in Watertown where both held menial jobs. I get the impression uh, while she wasn't violent and not as weird, she was, you know, on the same intellectually impaired level as Arthur. The two moved into a trailer on some land owned by Sarah's parents. Uh, He's their problem now. Arthur's family hoped that Mary and Sarah would help settle him down. Uh, Nope. Extreme untreated mental illness and brain damage doesn't just uh, go away when you get a girlfriend. Arthur got fired from Family Bargain Center (laughs) for making a comment to a woman who asked for a 44D bra, supposedly telling her, Hey, lady, you got to go to Syracuse. We don't have nothing that big here. And then Sarah quit in solidarity. I'm guessing that was not exactly what he said and that they already wanted to fire him before that. Maybe he said uh, something like, sorry, watermelon tits. Uh, You're going to have to take those dick pills to the circus. (laughs) Or uh, 44D. (laughs) Well, we don't have a bra for those milk towers, uh, but I can support it with my face. (laughs) Uh, maybe a 44D, uh, look like 44 or 46 E's to, to me. Let me slap my six inch meat ruler in, in between them. Uh, uh, make sure we really know what, what sides we're working with, sweet puss. Something like that. I'm sure it was way fucking creepier than the way they laid it out. Uh, for getting fired, uh, Arthur finds a new job construction and then gets fired there. Works a series of odd jobs after this. Fucking who knows how many head injuries he forgot to mention. Uh, often stole from work, faked injuries to collect workman's compensation. He also, according to some of his cousins, started having sexual problems if he hadn't been having them before. A few weeks into his marriage, when one cousin asked him how his uh, sex life was going, he reportedly said, I ain't got her yet. That's his quote. I ain't, I ain't got her yet. What a fucking creepy ass thing to say. How's married life? I ain't, I ain't got her yet. I ain't trapped her yet. Uh, rumors floated around, possibly started by his young wife, that he was struggling with impotence. In early 1965, he must have gotten it up at least once, or his wife had a boyfriend she didn't tell him about. Because in October that year, Sarah gave birth to Arthur's first child, a boy named Michael, and he was not happy. He would later say he never wanted kids. After she had the baby, Sarah allegedly refused to have sex with him for reasons never made entirely clear. Maybe he finally told her about his days of fucking chickens. Maybe he asked her to dress up like a chicken or like a cow or like his sister. Uh, Any of that would fuck up uh, most couples' sex lives, I imagine. Uh, Around this time, he gets a job as a butcher's apprentice and loves it. No surprise there. Uh, He would disgust and scare Sarah with drawn out tales about cutting up animals, being covered in their blood. Uh, excited and made him very happy. Uh, no red flags there. Nothing, nothing at all to be worried about there. Uh, November of 1965, Arthur is given another probationary charge for second degree burglary. Also assaulted a 13 year old who hit his car with a snowball that month. Oh man. This boy's mom filed a complaint. He got six months probation for a plea deal. That is probably his funniest crime. That kid really picked the wrong car to throw a snowball at. Holy shit. A cousin would later tell the authors of that misbegotten son book. I went to visit him and Sarah in their trailer. Uh, this customer called. It was cold as hell. Ice and snow everywhere. When I walked in, Artie says, I just got her. <laughs> Jesus. She's in the back resting. Go in and get her if you want. Fucking classic Artie. Uh, on brand. He continued, when I said no, he, ke- <laughs> he kept on saying, she's still back there. Go on, go, go get her. I said, no, thanks. God, this guy's he's fucking cartoonishly creepy. After a while, we left in his Pontiac and a kid hits the car with a snowball. Artie slams on the brakes. 
<laughs> he always ran funny, bent over frontwards, but he could cover ground. When the kid went into his house, Artie busted through the storm door, slapped the kid around. On the way out, he got caught in the broken door. A girl started yelling inside. Artie pretended now that his shoulder was broken and started crying like a baby. He got loose. He says to me, you're going to have to drive. You don't mind, do you? All the way to Watertown, he kept moaning. He would pass out, wake up and moan again. But then suddenly he'd snap out of it and say things like, how's the drive? A lot of power, right? Son of a bitch was faking as usual. I knew his act. <laughs> again, this dude was fucking crazy. Uh, I wonder if that kid later found out about Shawcross uh, killing a few kids. Oh, man. Kid's mom reported him. You know, he's picked up, arrested. After three days behind bars, he pled guilty to unlawful entry, sentenced to six additional months of probation. Judge took note of the offender's behavior, ordered a psychiatric exam. Mental health clinic found him to be emotionally unstable personality who reacted with excitability and ineffectiveness when confronted by minor stress. Okay. Uh, after this evaluation, after getting uh, sick of living with his psycho, Sarah files for divorce. Arthur gives up custody of his son. He will never see him or even try to see him again. Uh, kid lucked out there. Arthur will later say that they separated because she didn't want to give him uh, oral sex or receive oral sex from him. And that was the only kind he really liked. Uh-huh. Uh, after another year or so of creeping everyone in the area out, probably killing a lot more animals, maybe peeping on some folks, April 7th, 1967, 20-year-old Arthur is drafted into the army to fight in the Vietnam War. Apparently, they would take literally fucking anyone at that time. Uh, as long as they were physically able, didn't matter what their brain was like. Art completed basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia, became a supply and parts specialist, got in a little trouble in Georgia early on, but nothing major, failed to show up to work, was fined uh, 11 bucks and restricted to post for 14 days, and then he faced no charges after that and seemed to behave himself. Uh, also uh, made a new lady friend, Linda Neary, and then married her after a brief courtship. Uh, Linda's birth name was Phyllis Lee Brown. She was adopted by the Neary family. They changed her name in 1966. She got a job working as a bartender at a square dance hall called McFarland's Loft. And that's when she met dancing superstar, Arthur. Crazy boy got some crazy feet, shot cross. Uh, he asked her to dance. She agreed for reasons I will never understand. And uh, they spent the evening talking about his first wife and his job. I'm guessing he left out the part about beating up that kid or leaving her because she wouldn't let him uh, eat her pussy. Or maybe not. Maybe that got her engine revving. Uh, they went on a few dates. You know, she learned that he only wanted to be called Art or Artie, that he loved fishing, hated driving, and hated school. He also constantly talked about his mom and winning her approval. Probably left out the peeping Tom stuff. Probably left out the fantasy about her blowing him all the time or eating her puss all the time. Or again, maybe that was exactly what she wanted to hear, but I doubt it. Uh, she learned Artie was extremely inflexible. He never deviated from the plan, hated being late, and never pushed her for sex. Uh, Linda's family didn't want her to get married until Artie was out of the army, but they didn't listen. All right, they got married one day before his leave ended in a local church. Linda's 20. Arthur John, 22. Instead of having sex on their wedding night, uh, Linda found it odd that Artie instead went fishing alone. Uh, yeah, that is that's, uh, that is pretty odd. Next day, he told Linda about his past crimes and arrests. Wonder how that talk went. Uh, then he packed up his fishing gear, left for Vietnam without consummating the marriage. The Watertown Daily Times reported the marriage, and then his first wife, Sarah, called Linda to tell her that Arthur was fucking crazy. Uh, Linda didn't believe her. Uh, she would learn, learn soon enough that Sarah was not kidding. Uh, from April 1967 to September 1968, Shaw Cross served a tour of duty in Vietnam, worked with the Force Supply and Transport Company of the 4th Infantry Division as a supply clerk in a non-combat role. He arranged the distribution of ammunition and had to travel to various units by helicopter. Nothing, absolutely nothing in his records indicates that he ever saw combat, let alone participated in combat. Artie Oddball, however, would claim for the rest of his life that he was a weapons specialist who completed, quote, one man kill them all missions, <laughs> uh, hunting Viet Cong, like bunch of Rambo shit. One of Arthur's favorite stories to retell was about how he once murdered and cannibalized two young Vietnamese girls, said he found them hiding guns in a tree. So he shot one, tied the other to the tree. Then he cut the uh, injured one uh, woman's head off, put it on a post for the Viet Cong to see. Then he cut off part of her thigh and ate it. Said the second lady now pissed and shit herself with fear. Then he went down on that lady. You know, ate her puss, then raped her, then shot her in the head. He loved to tell this story, especially to women interviewing him. Uh, seems as if this story was entirely fantasy, but it was a fantasy that he would try to reenact or you know act out in real life in some ways with all two real victims Later, like variations of it. I don't know. Maybe he did do something to some poor woman over there. I uh, doubt she was armed. She's probably a sex worker because he did say he attacked several Vietnamese sex workers, some of them as young as 11. And maybe he did. Maybe this is when and where he began to terrorize, possibly even kill sex workers. Maybe this is where he first killed children. 
Dude loved to shock people with tales about his depravity, but he really would also do a lot of horrible shit. Shawcross also claimed to have killed 39 soldiers in combat, and virtually no one believes that. Highly disputed by authorities and those he served with. Uh, This claim literally laughed at by some. Uh, He would become a one-man killing machine, but only when the enemy was unarmed women and children who had, you know, uh, who he'd gained their trust of. Uh, Arthur returned home from Vietnam in the fall of 1968. He experienced violent flashbacks and nightmares. One night when Linda touched him in 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 his sleep, he hit her so hard he almost broke her jaw. Probably traumatized by memories of uh, some poor sex worker fighting back when he tried to attack her or something. Uh, Arthur was transferred to Fort Sill, Oklahoma to finish his service as an armorer. And in Oklahoma, the Shaw Crosses apparently lived a a somewhat normal life for a little while. Already worked, spent time outdoors. Linda did volunteer teaching. She would later say that everything was fine except for their sex life. Already had trouble getting and maintaining erections. We get very angry about it. She didn't know what to do. She also noticed how, uh, you know, Arthur loved hugging and cuddling. He was obsessed with non-sexual affection. Linda once asked him how his parents showed him uh, love, and he said, by giving me things I wanted. Okay, interesting, but is that true? Or was that just uh, another fantasy he told her about his childhood? Right? He would tell so many different people so many different things. He was truly a pathological liar. Uh, as time passed, Art's mood turned dark. This may have been triggered by yet another terrible head injury. This time, he fell off a 40... <laughs> he fell off a 40-foot ladder. I guess he hit his head when he landed. And smashed his head into the ground, knocked unconscious, taken to the hospital again. Rock, discus, sledgehammer, ladder. Uh, in an interview I watched that he gave many years later, he shows the interviewer several significant scars and what I would just call fucking dents in his big head. When his brain was examined after he died, his frontal lobe was found to have like significant scarring on it. Uh, they knew before he died, he had a cyst on his frontal lobe. His, his never worked that well to begin with brain. It's so goddamn scrambled by this point. Now he becomes severely depressed. He tells Linda he hated his job because he hated authority. Tells her uh, that his parents never allowed him to cry. So that affected his moods. Uh, One day he comes home from work, uh, says he needs to see a psychiatrist. He's upset, refuses to talk. He soon speaks with an army psychiatrist who suggested he be committed to a mental hospital. The doctor refused to tell Linda why he should be committed. And then she refused to sign the commitment papers. I wonder what that doctor was uh, too afraid to tell her. Um, uh, 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 Ma'am, medically speaking, scientifically speaking, your husband should not just be committed. He, uh, He should be exterminated. He should be put down. He is, uh, as we say in the biz, a fucking lunatic and you need to run like now run away i'll stall him R- right now just never stop running uh she called arthur's parents asked them what uh you know she should do they both insisted nothing was wrong with her son and refused to have him committed big mistake i'm kind of surprised by that right they knew he was so fucked up why not have him committed i wonder if it was because of embarrassment you know maybe what their friends neighbors and family would think right it seems like the, it seems like their weird son was finally making something of himself now he, he's married he's in the he's in the military but now crazy boy is going to be committed So much stigma around mental health back then. Arthur did take some kind of prescribed meds, but uh, they didn't seem to help. Not long after refusing to be committed, he and Linda's dog, still puppy, uh, still a puppy, excuse me, nipped at Arthur. So, you know, he overreacts slightly, throws it against the wall, then snaps his neck and kills it. So just a bit of an overreaction. A wee bit terrifying for Linda. Uh, Bojangles told me he would have loved to see Shawcross try and pull that shit with him. Uh, Linda later said, I kept thinking about how quick it happened. Instantly. What would he do to me the next time he lost his temper? He seemed to be losing control. He'd go from quiet to violent in a split second. And there didn't need to be a reason. I was afraid of him. I still loved him, but I kept hearing him snap that dog's neck. Can you imagine seeing your partner do that? Could you come back from that in a relationship? If Lindsay did that to like Penny or Ginger Bells, sweet Gigi, I think we're done. Uh, Makes me think about what we learned earlier about his brain, right? How he truly had trouble regulating his mood. Biologically more prone to violence than the average person. Spring of 1969, Arthur is honorably discharged from the army. Linda is three months pregnant at this time. They move to Clayton on the St. Lawrence River, just a 20, uh, 20 minute drive north of Watertown. He's back, right? The pride of Jefferson County, the prodigal son returns. Uh, Arthur makes a disability claim. It's awarded $23 a month. Not much, still less than 200 bucks in today's money uh, when adjusted for inflation. Despite bringing in almost no money, he doesn't want to look for a job, wants to fish all day. Starts drinking a lot, lying, also starts criticizing uh, Linda's appearance a lot. In April of 1969, at Linda's insistence, he gets a job at a local paper mill. After just three weeks on the job, he earns a commendation for putting out a fire, which sounds very impressive until you realize he probably started the fire. Uh, started to become weirdly jealous around this time. 
He suddenly didn't want Linda to spend time with her family. One day when she returned home from visiting her brother, who she had not seen in 11 years, uh, she and Arthur got into a crazy fight. He told her, well, you could spend some time with me. She responded, I'm always here with you. And he just fucking went nuts. Right. Uh, uh, then when Linda asked him if uh, you know he was ready to eat dinner, she says, now he's like so angry already. He says, she says he got the same look on his face that he had the night he killed our dog. I was four months pregnant, tried to put my hands over my stomach, but I couldn't block his fists. He beat me till I blacked out. And then she miscarried. Her brother then goes to their house, punches Arthur, threatens to kill him if he ever touches Linda again. Too bad he didn't kill him that day. Uh, Linda's father also went to the house, sees that Arthur had attempted suicide by slashing his wrists. Uh, Linda now tells a social worker she wants to end the marriage. Uh, she is uh, discharged from the hospital after two weeks of being there after her beating. When she gets home, Arthur refuses to leave the house. So when he leaves her work one day, she and her dad pack up all his shit, put it out on the front steps, lock him out. Fuck yeah, bro. Hail Nimrod, good guidance, Lucifina. Arthur tells her he's going to contest a divorce, but she refuses to back down and does get it all taken care of. And then Art moves in with a friend. And while live with that friend, he sets fire to a nearby barn, sets fire to a milk plant, gets arrested for both. He is convicted of arson, now sentenced to five years in prison. He will serve two. Uh, he will serve the first six months of his sentence in the infamous Attica Correctional Facility in Attica, New York. He will claim later that three black inmates raped him there and that he then beat and raped each one of them in a, you know, little uh, campaign of vengeance. I'm going to say no. I'm going to call bullshit on all that. Uh, highly doubt it. This reminds me of the Vietnam shit. Maybe the first part where he got raped happened, but I, I doubt even that. He was not a looker. I bet those guys, if they were real, could have easily found some sexier butts. Uh, he served the remainder of his sentence at the Auburn Correctional Facility in Auburn, New York. And while in prison, Linda and Art's divorce is finalized in October of 1969. And then she never sees him again. Uh, October 18th, 1971. Arthur is released from prison before his five years are up because he saved a prison guard who was clubbed during a riot. Not sure how that came about. Nicest thing he probably ever did in his life. Maybe he just thought that would get him out early. He moves back home. I'm sure mom and dad are thrilled. Yay! Our sweet boy is returned. Uh, then he gets a job as a handyman at the Watertown Public Works Department. A prison psychiatrist uh, recommended he be kept under close supervision and undergo outpatient therapy. He was actually mandated to undergo outpatient therapy, but he didn't. And because the parole board was short-staffed and underfunded, no one followed up on uh, punishing him for that. Once home, he reunites with Penny Nickel Sherbino, childhood friend of Jeannie's. Remember Jeannie? Little sister he claimed to uh, sleep with growing up, the one he peeped on. Now she's setting him up with her friend, Penny. That's cool. This should end well. Penny and Arthur had known each other since they were uh, kids, since the, uh, since the 50s. They both attended General Brown Central School. And why the fuck would you ever want to talk to this weirdo if you grew up with him? Why, why would you marry him? Clearly her life is in shambles. Or maybe she remembered him dominating on the wrestling mat. Uh, the two reconnected in January of 1972 in front of the local J.C. Penney's. Art was 26, said he had just left the army, probably told her he'd gotten like 15 purple hearts, you know, 30, 40 purple, you know, or uh, silver stars, maybe five or 10 medals of honor, you know, probably had a battleship or two named after him, was in talks with Hollywood producers to have Clint Eastwood play him in a movie, no big deal. Uh, Penny had two kids from a previous relationship. He and Penny go on a few dates. Uh, she would later say he was fascinated by her four-year-old son and two-year-old daughter, not creepy at all. She becomes pregnant by their fifth date. Apparently he was able to get it up with her and was as potent as his father. Arthur promised he would help her raise a child. They move in together at the Cloverdale Apartments in Watertown. Uh, once they start living together, Penny remembers, um, you know, him becoming a complete fucking weirdo. I don't know how she didn't know that already. Uh, he's now an extremely neat man who values order, demands that she iron him a white shirt every morning. Uh, he refuses to drive to work. He will walk six to eight miles to work every day. Eventually, he will save up for a bike and ride that instead. Um, he uh, often leaves after dinner to go fishing, but never brings home any fish. <laughs> and he does so many crazy things. Uh, one time he just out of the blue gives a neighbor flowers along with a note that reads, these are for your grave. There was nothing wrong with this neighbor. That is creepy as fuck. Imagine getting flowers and a note like that randomly from a neighbor. How much is that going to mess you up? Especially if you hadn't even had an interaction, done anything with the guy. Do that to a neighbor. Uh, let the rest of us know how it goes. Uh, holy fuck, he was nuts. Out of all the other killers we've covered so far, he reminds me the most of Richard Chase, the vampire of Sacramento, right? The guy who used the uh, penis of a baby he'd killed as a straw to drink blood with. One of the most fucked up things I've ever heard of anyone doing. Uh, Arthur also starts flirting with other women in front of Penny, um, tells her that her kids are annoying him now, but also seems obsessed with other people's kids, especially little boys with blonde hair, likes to play with kids on the apartment's playground after work. Fucking what? The story's about to get even more ridiculous. 
He now begins to regularly start playing with other people's small children at the apartment playground. It's not like he's there watching Penny's kids. He would just go and just hang out with little kids. Uh, so he like roughhouse with them. Sometimes he would roughhouse with them, you know, too much. They would get scared of him. No one makes him stop. Why the fuck is he out there roughhousing with other people's kids? Dude, I used to take my kids to parks all the time when they were young. And we lived in Santa Monica. And if some other grown up would have just like started playing with them and grabbed one of them in some kind of game, holy shit, we, we would have had some words. I would have lost my fucking mind. I wonder if anyone told him to fuck off, stay away from the goddamn playground. Apparently not. Um, if a stranger starts playing with your kids in a way that makes you even slightly uncomfortable, do not hesitate to cause a scene, right? Go gather other people to help you if you're scared. I would love to see creepy adults like this get fucking straight up lynched, right? Just get their ass beat by an angry mob for stuff like this. I'd love to watch YouTube videos of creeps hanging around playgrounds just being confronted by an angry mob who just kick the shit out of them. Could not find those videos uh, with a quick search, unfortunately. Uh, we need a zero tolerance policy for weirdos fucking with kids. Penny's daughter tells uh, her around this time that she's afraid of being alone with Arthur. So, you know, smart kid. Penny didn't want to get married, but her pregnancy is starting to show. She doesn't want to tarnish the family name, all that dumb bullshit. So she, uh, she plans a marriage with Arthur. His mom and sister oppose the marriage, but won't say why. On April 22nd, 1972, they get married. Uh, he is 26. Penny is, uh, you know, uh, oh, she is, oh my gosh, 22. Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't write her age. I'm not going to guess. Why, why am I making up age for her? Does it, she's, she's younger. She's a little bit younger. Uh, the first, uh, you know, um, two uh, left shit. Oh, sorry. I, I, now I know what I'm saying. I got so confused, hung up on her age. Um, yeah, he gets he gets married for the third time and his first two have already left because he scared them. There we go. Now everything's making sense. Uh, they have a small reception at Penny's brother's house. Then Arthur heads back to the fucking playground on his wedding night. What the fuck? He really does this. If your adult partner spends your wedding night at a playground messing around with strangers' kids, definitely file for annulment. At least consider killing them or having them killed. Thankfully, Penny uh, miscarriages or has a miscarriage, miscarries their baby shortly after the wedding. And now our weird story will get darker. May 6, 1972, Jack Blake, Shawcross's first victim, disappears from Watertown. Uh, Jack was just 10 years old. Jack was one of uh, the nine children of Mary Blake and Alan Blake, a.k.a. Pete. Jack had asthma, but he was an active and curious child. According to his mom, Jack was always looking out for his siblings and it saved them numerous times from accidents. Jack, Jack once had to steal a loaf of bread because his dad spent the family's grocery money on alcohol. Uh, sometimes he skipped school, but overall, very good kid. Blonde hair, freckles, big ears, walked with a limp because one of his feet turned inward. His favorite shirt said, I act different because I am different. I love little Jack. Dude, that's spunk. Could have been something great if uh, some gas would have been poured onto his flame instead of having it viciously snuffed out by a monster. Spring of 1972, little Jack tells his mom about a stranger who took him and his brother, Pete, fishing. And his mom was furious. She told her sons, don't you ever go near that man again. My God, he could take you somewhere and I'd never know what happened. I feel like she should have done more. In instances like this, highly encourage parents to ask your kid to point that dude out. Go for a little ride. Go for a little drive around the neighborhood. Find that motherfucker. Take a picture of them. Tell him you're going to show that pic to the police. Tell him to never, ever show his face anywhere near your kids again do show that photo to the police tell them everything uh i can't advise this legally but if i see a guy like that i'm gonna make it very clear to him that some really bad shit is gonna happen to him if he doesn't say the fuck away from not just my family but all other kids gotta help protect not just our own kids but other people's kids from these sick fucks right the police only have so many officers and so much time they can't stop everyone gotta protect that family uh protect the community a few days later, the strange man shows up at Mary's house. Jack introduces him uh, as his friend, Art, asked to go fishing with him. Pete Sr.'s home. He and Mary say, uh, no, tell Arthur to never take Jack anywhere. And again, not enough, right? If Pete had been a, a better, more protective dad, th this is the guy who drank away his family's food money. You know, he would have told Arthur uh, a lot fucking more than that. Get vicious with these motherfuckers or find someone who will, right? Let evil know you're willing to be more evil. Uh, full disclosure, I am doing testosterone therapy right now to kick up my energy levels and extend some youth. And uh, I can feel the angry uh, hormone boiling in my blood when I think about situations like this. I feel more prone to violence and uh, I like it. Thank you, modern science. Hail Lucifina. Uh, back to the narrative. Jack's dad promises to take the boys fishing the next week, but on the day of the fishing trip, you know, Pete Sr. gets fucking hammered and can't leave the house. So that's awesome. Jack asks his mom if he can go play. Mary tells him to be home by dinner. 
right? She's going to take him out uh, to bingo that night, something Jack loved. But Jack never shows up for dinner or bingo. Mary's worried. Excuse me, but initially just figures, you know, he's off playing somewhere. Uh, she goes to the bingo hall alone, returns at 10 p.m. Jack's still not home. Uh, Mary didn't think Jack would run away, but seeds of doubt began to creep in her mind. She just recently told Jack that Pete Sr., not his real dad, man named Bob was. And she's worried that Jack is upset and uh, wants to stay with his friends. Mary now questions her son Pete Jr. about his day with Jack. And according to Pete, you know, they went to try out their friend's new bike. Jack crashed the bike. The friend threatened to call the cops. So they ran off. Then Jack left Pete to visit his girlfriend at the Cloverdale Apartments. And Pete hadn't seen him since. Uh, uh, but that wasn't the whole story. Pete didn't tell his mom something very important. A few days after Mary and Pete sent Arthur away, Jack and Pete had seen that crazy fuck uh, walking near a bridge in the neighborhood. Uh, he'd asked them if they wanted to go fishing, promised to fix things with their parents when they got done, and the boys agreed. And when they went fishing, Arthur seemed only interested in little Jack, constantly talking to him, trying to touch him. Then he invited both boys back to his apartment in the Cloverdale housing complex. Uh, you know, but it seemed like he really just wanted Jack to be there. Jesus. Uh, Arthur and the boys ate lunch together. Then, like the super cool dude he was, he talked to them about killing girls in Vietnam, showed them pornographic pictures, and talked to them about sex. Then they went and fished, uh, you know, fished some more on the Black River that cut through Watertown. At one point, as they walked towards the riverbanks, uh, Jack ran ahead of the group. Suddenly, Arthur grabbed little Pete's arm, threatened to drop him into the quarry if Jack didn't come back. When Jack returned, Arthur said he was just kidding around. Jack and Pete were terrified. They ran away. When they got home, they confessed everything to their dad, who was intent on killing Arthur. Finally, old drunk Pete showed a little bit of parental life there. But then Jack convinced him to not kill him. Or he was a fucking coward and just, you know, got drunk again instead. Uh, why didn't they at least report all this to the police immediately? You know, what, what do you do if some creep wants to fish with your kids? Right? Uh, you know, you tell them to stay away and then this happens. Time to invite Arthur over. Show him the 9 millimeters. Right? Show him the Mossberg 12 gauge. Hollow point bullets. Slugs. Talk to him about how sometimes it's worth it to go to prison. Uh, to do what's right. Talk about how easy it would be to kill a motherfucker and dump their body in the river. If he thought that was the only way you could keep your kids safe. Or, you know, something like that. 10.30 p.m., Mary calls her neighbors, family, all of Jack's friends. Then she calls the police. She's told they can't make a report until 24 hours have passed, but that they would send an officer anyway. Mary tells the officer she suspected Arthur was involved because of his inappropriate interest in Jack. She can only give the officer a first name and possible location, Cloverdale Apartments. Mary goes over there with the officer to the Cloverdale Apartments, confronts Arthur. He says he doesn't know where Jack was, uh, hadn't seen him since that afternoon, said he'd uh, been playing with a boy named Jimmy earlier. Mary didn't believe him. Why did Audie, Artie, excuse me, Oddball, know who Jack was playing with? Why is that creep so in tune with what the area kids are up to? Uh, Watertown PD never briefed incoming shifts after this about Jack and didn't log Mary's phone call. Uh, the police weren't big fans of the Blake family because Jack's older siblings were very prone to public drunkenness and stealing. This is like kind of like the, uh, I can't think of their name right now, just popped in my head, but the, uh, the, the family from the Showtime series, uh, Shameless. Uh, obviously unfortunate. Mary started, uh, you know, her own search the next morning. She went to Jack's favorite hangout spot where she saw a child's footprint and an adult footprint. When she got home, Pete Sr. informed her that Arthur had just shown up, asked to help look for Jack. Mary returned to Cloverdale, confronted Art about Jimmy. He was evasive. Penny Sherpino, or Sherbino, you know, his, uh, his wife, Arthur's wife, slammed the door in Mary's face. Oh, boy. Mary then went to the playground, started asking around, learned that the day before Arthur had approached, or that the day before Arthur had approached Jack and invited him fishing. Jack said he had worms at home and left. The boy couldn't remember if he left with Arthur or not. Mary ran home. Sure enough, Jack's worm box was empty. She called the police again, told him that Arthur Shawcross took her son fishing yesterday and he never came back and she wanted him arrested. The officer on the phone told her that no boy named Jack Blake had been reported missing. So what the fuck is going on? Right? This case not being handled real well. Uh, seriously, might head to this dude's house with one or more of my guns at this point, force my way in, torture him until he confesses, and then, you know, probably kill him. Can't imagine the rage you would feel in a situation like this. I mean, imagine that. To know that this motherfucker did something to your kid and that the police won't arrest him. How hard is it not to go full-on vigilante in a situation like that? Mary now contacts the local paper, the mayor, the county sheriff, and a senator. Good for her. They finally get the local police to agree to search the woods for Jack, but they find nothing. Mary also informed there were no further plans to search for Jack, so she, uh, you know, now calls uh, or goes door to door, you know, asking asking about the situation, and calls her husband's last military post, the fire department, the New York State Police. These agencies do search the woods for Jack. By the next week, the National Guard is involved as well, but they don't find anything. Watertown Police Chief calls off the search. For weeks, there's lots of false leads now, tips, but no clues as to where Jack has gone. This poor mother. Uh, I wonder if authorities just thought, you know, Jack ran away. May 17th, 1972. 
Shawcross now gets in actual trouble with the police. Why? Uh, this is so absurd. So absurd. He assaulted some kids at that Cloverdale apartment playground. Dude actually dumped one kid into a trash can like a schoolyard bully. Grabbed a six-year-old, stuffed grass in his shirt and pants, and when that boy tried to resist, pushed him down, pulled his pants down, and spanked his bare ass. And how much trouble did he get in? He was fined 10 bucks for harassment. What the fuck is happening in this story? How did no other adults in the area not see this and put a stop to it? How did that kid's parents not take a fucking baseball bat? Are you kidding me? Somebody spanks your kid's bare ass at the playground? And he's just charged with a fine, ah, oh, 10 bucks. This happens in broad daylight. He's hanging out at the playground, no kid of his own, all the time, apparently. He's a regular at the playground. I mean, maybe Penny's kids are there sometimes, but I just think it's him. Ah, oh, no one's beating his ass yet. Please give him a slap on the wrist. You know, yet, you know, people are in prison for life for selling weed. So cool, 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 cool. Uh, September 2nd, 1972, Artie, God, I wish he would have been drowned at birth shot cross, murdered his second victim, even younger child, eight-year-old Karen Ann Hill. It was the start of Labor Day weekend. Helene Hill's new boyfriend, Stan Fisher, suggested a trip to Watertown to visit his half-sister and family. Ah, man, the guilt he must have felt. Helene was just going to bring her youngest child, but then Karen begged to go at the last minute as well. Helene described Karen as a beautiful girl with big chocolate brown eyes, honey blonde hair. She was an independent spirit. Her dream was to grow up and become a movie star. On the afternoon of September 2nd, Helene went inside to wash her hair, made Karen promise not to leave the yard. Then when she came back outside, Karen was gone. What a nightmare. Helene was worried, but figured Karen had just walked to the public square in town. A series of important sightings then followed that will lead to Arthur's arrest. 2 p.m., David McGrath, local college student, sees a little blonde girl climbing the fence that ran from the corner of a plant to an old iron bridge. She seemed like she was looking for something. There was a brown and white bike popped up against the fencing. David thought she couldn't be wandering, or she shouldn't be wandering so close to the river, but chose to mind his own business. Ten minutes later, he was driving back from the gas station. He notices that the girl and the bike are gone. A few minutes later, four teenage girls approach the same bridge. They see a man now climbing up the embankment and over the fence. He had a brown and white bike, two fishing rods, and a creel. Smiled at the girls, and they continued on. 2.45 p.m., 16-year-old Terry Tenney walks past the railroad tracks in town, sees a man in a brown and white bike near the bridge and plant, recognizes the man as Arthur Shawcross, his neighbor at Cloverdale, the creep from the playground. The dude who liked to wrestle, who always seemed to have a boner popping out of his pants. I uh, may have added those last two details, but they may have been accurate. Arthur asked if Terry, uh, or, you know, if, if he wanted an ice cream cone, offered to take some of his shopping bags home. Uh, of course, he offered him ice cream, just keeping it on brand, keeping it creepy. 4 p.m., Helene tells her boyfriend, Stan, she can't find Karen. Still not too worried, though. It was a beautiful day. Lots of people were walking around town. She figured, you know, Karen had to be around somewhere. She was a lot calmer than I would have been. After I lost sight of Kyler one time at Disneyland, for probably no exaggeration, about three seconds, I went and bought one of those backpacks for little kids that are really just a leash. And he was leashed up like some kind of kid-dog hybrid for the next several visits. Kyler Monroe are now 16 to 14. I track them on Find a Friend all the time. I make them check in with me like an annoying amount. I'm an old school Jewish mother who happens to look like a, a Gentile hillbilly looking dude. And I, and I have uh, too much of this stuff in my head all the time to not be worried. Helene goes for a walk, asks around. No one had seen Karen. Now she starts to worry. Helene calls the police at 5.45 p.m. Officer shows up five minutes later. Said they'll start looking. Uh, Stan's sister-in-law approaches Mary Blake, asks if uh, she has seen Karen. Jack's mom, you know, Mary, wants to help with the search, but has to take care of her kids at home. She has a sick feeling Arthur Shawcross is involved. Officers receive a tip from David McGrath that evening, that college kid who saw Karen earlier. Uh, he heard about Karen on the radio, had a feeling she may, she may have been the girl he saw, you know, by the bridge in the plant. She was. 10 p.m., Karen's body is found under that old iron bridge. She had been raped and murdered. She was naked from the waist down, her clothes stained with blood, her killer forced mud, leaves, other debris down her throat, and stuffed it inside her clothes. Remember him doing something similar to the kid on the playground? Stuffing grass in his pants. He was probably acting out a sexual fantasy there. Detective Charles Kabinsky, one of the responding officers at the scene, he immediately asked his fellow officers if anyone had seen Arthur Shawcross that day. Kabinsky went back to the station to read the day's reports, saw David McGrath's tip. The hospital report reve revealed that Karen had been dead for 8 to 12 hours. She had been punched, strangled, raped, semen present on her body, her mouth and throat plugged with mud and soot. Kabinsky thought of Shawcross because of the incident of him stuffing grass, you know, down the boy's pants at the playground. Shawcross arrived at the police station just after midnight, gave police the story of his day, said he left his apartment at 7 a.m. 
After a few hours of fishing, went home for a break, said he rode his bike to the bargain center, bought a Coke, visited a friend, crossed the Iron Bridge. After that, he ran into a neighbor from Cloverdale, bought him some ice cream, carried a shopping bag for him, got home at 3.15. Detective Kaminsky noticed that Arthur went way out of his way to establish a timeline for the time he was around the bridge, making sure he wasn't there when Karen was, uh, would, would have died. Charcross said he went out to the shopping plaza uh, two more times, bought things for himself, sneakers for his stepson, spent the rest of the evening at home. He was interviewed until 2 a.m. and was then released. The next day, Kubinski learned about the report from the teenage girls. They had seen him on the bridge at the time of the murder, which disproved his alibi, calls Shawcross back in. Uh, Junior, you know, goes to his alibi one more time. Now he's, uh, you know, very inconsistent with uh, the times he was out so when he was on the bridge, doesn't match up to his previous story. Eventually, he just stops talking and refuses to answer more questions. At 8 a.m. on the 3rd, a bloodhound traces Art's scent from the Iron Bridge back to his apartment. Art goes in for a third round of questioning. Fucking bloodhound. I know I just downplay, uh, downplayed the dog tracking situation with Scott and Lady, Lacey Peterson's case last week. Uh, and, and it clearly helps here. So why did I downplay it earlier? Well, because Scott could have had, likely did have his wife sent on his clothes at the marina. There was a reason for Lacey sent to be, you know, at the marina. In this case, there was no reason for Arthur to have this little girl sent on him or at his place. 9.30 a.m., Arthur finally blurts out, well, I must have done it. Kabinsky's furious. Bullshit. Don't give me I must have done it. You did it. You know you did it. And Art said, I probably did it, but I don't actually remember. Hmm, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe he didn't remember. He's a fucking maniac. September 3rd, 1972, Arthur Shawcross arrested for the murder of Karen Hill. As Kubinski prepared his report, he thought of Jack Blake, remembered a report from a man named William Corky Murcock, who had called in to report a suspicious man who came out of the woods behind his motel and gas station around the time Jack disappeared. The interrogation is not over. At 10 p.m., after more questioning, Arthur hints that he knows where Jack Blake is buried. He tells Kubinski, okay, Charlie, I'll help you, and maybe you can help me, but let me sleep on it. He's enjoying this, and he wants a deal, and he'll get one. Uh, September 6, 1972, the police begin a new search for Jack Blake. With Arthur's help, they find him at 3.30 p.m. Under Sheriff John Griff notices that strips of bark were removed from a tree and aligned with a bulge in the earth. They were covering a body. He would write, The slight skeleton was unclothed. A wisp of blonde hair grew from the middle of the skull. A few teeth appeared to be missing. There were no apparent fractures or bullet holes. About 35 feet away from the skeleton, they found a gray t-shirt that said, I act different because I am different. Uh, Blake was written on the back of the shirt. The interrogation continued back at the police station. Arthur helped them locate Blake's body, but did not confess to killing him. He now says, what's going to happen to me if I tell you something? And now they offer him a ridiculous plea deal. They apparently didn't think they had enough evidence to convict him without a strong confession. A lot of people would disagree later. This decision will heavily be heavily criticized uh, when word of his sentencing reaches the media and has been criticized ever since. Arthur confessed that he lured Jack into the woods after he gets his deal, stripped him, forced him to run through the woods in fucking terror, then captured him, raped him, beat, and strangled him. Claims to have then eaten Jack's heart and genitals. Why can't that level of crime carry an automatic, brutal execution sentence? Jack's cause of death was uh, undetermined, but the pathologist did conclude his clothes were removed before death. His uh, uh, unofficial opinion was that Jack died from strangulation. October 17th, 1972. Art takes his plea deal in exchange for his confession. He's given only a manslaughter charge for killing Karen, not charged at all for killing Jack. And a judge sentences him to 25 years in prison. Penny Sherbino, extremely upset with her husband. I would fucking hope so. Arthur tells her he didn't commit the murders. He was framed. And they will write to each other for the next three to four years. Still be married before the letters finally stop. Months later, Arthur will write to Penny that, uh, you know, he confesses. He did murder both children. Penny writes back that he was a rotten, stupid son of a bitch and that she hoped he died. Then Arthur files for a divorce citing cruel and inhuman treatment. Uh, that's a twist. Uh, Your Honor, I, I, I simply cannot remain in this marriage anymore. And why not, son? Well, uh, cruel and, and inhuman treatment, Your Honor. Uh, Be more specific, son. Uh, Your Honor, I believe a marriage is built mostly on respect, trust, honesty, and compassion. And when I was honest with my wife, when I told her that, yeah, I did rape and kill two kids, even though I played with so many other kids on the playground that I never raped and killed even one time. And she told me she wanted me to die. Is that compassion? She told me I was a rotten son of a bitch. Is that respect? I mean, (laughs) is, is it? I see what you're saying, son. Speak no more. You are clearly married to a cruel, vindictive, stone-hearted witch. 
and I grant you an immediate divorce and wish you better romantic luck going forward. Uh, Arthur will serve his sentence in the New York Penitentiary in Greenhaven. During his first eight years, he'll get in trouble for fighting, stealing, lighting fires, uh, refusing to leave his cell, all very much on brand, all classic crazy boy behavior. Uh, after all that, though, he's a model, model prisoner. Uh, no one knows exactly what, you know, switch flipped in his head, but, but I think it was romantic. Uh, maybe it was the influence of a new lady in his life. Yes, this motherfucker is given yet another chance at love. And people still believe in karma in a just and loving God who intervenes in our lives here on earth. Okay, uh-huh. And that belief is reconciled with stories like this. Uh, how exactly? For the next dozen years of his sentence, Arthur writes letters with Rose Wally, a woman from Delhi, New York. Rose's daughter had visited Greenhaven and returned with his pen pal information. Uh-huh. Why is Rose's daughter going to a fucking prison to find Mama New Man? So little of this story makes sense to me. The world makes no sense to me as I get lost in the story. The actions and reactions, so many of the characters are just mind-boggling. Rose was separated from her husband and lonely and apparently borderline completely unfuckable for her to be trolling for new dick in the sex offender section of the state penitentiary. Arthur said he loved her, wanted to marry her when he gets out. Sweet Christ, this lady is a complete fucking idiot. If you become not just a pedophile's romantic pen pal while they're in prison, but, but a, a murdering pedophile's pen pal, I'm going to go ahead and harshly judge you. Best case, you are a sad idiot. Worst case, you're a fucking creep. For not having something like that, uh, you know, like what Shawcross did bother you to the point that you would just, you know, rather fucking light him on fire than associate with him, let alone marry him. Oh, my God. October 1973, psychologist Dr. McWilliams, J.R. McWilliams, examines Arthur. Has him take the Bender Motor Gasalt Test and the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. Dr. McWilliams somehow finds no evidence of serious neurological impairment. Uh, others will later not come to this conclusion at all. He does diagnose Arthur with depression and says he relied on fantasy as a source of satisfaction. 1976, another psychiatrist, Dr. Michael Bakia, examines Art, determines he has not come to terms with the severity of his crimes, that he consistently blamed others for his problems. Mommy made me do it! Uh, believed that Art had requested several mental health evaluations, not because he wanted to get better, but because he wanted to bullshit his way uh, out of prison, wanted to impress the parole board. Sounds right. June of 1997, yet another psychiatrist examines Arthur, diagnoses him with schizoid personality disorder and antisocial behavior. He wrote, this man does not show a good degree of evidence for successfully resolving or working out his psychosexual conflicts. I.e., I read that as, do not ever let this motherfucker out. He is too crazy to understand how crazy he is. He will never get better. 1982, uh, Art completes his GED, enrolls in horticulture courses at Penn State. So that's fun. That same year, parole board notes that he uh, exhibited a belligerent reaction represented a for, representing a foreboding potential for a possible reenactment of his tragic behavior. Again, I read this as, do not ever let this piece of shit out. He is walking evil. He is a demon disguised as a man. April 28th, 1987, after serving 15 years, a little bit less actually, Arthur Shawcross is somehow granted parole against the advice of many. His parole officer, Robert T. Kent, wrote to his superiors before Shawcross's release, saying, at the risk of being melodramatic, the writer considers the man to be possibly the most dangerous individual to be released to this community for many years. Mm -hmm. Edward Elwin, yet another idiot in this story full of so many idiots, the executive director of the New York Parole Division, defended Arthur's release. He essentially said that if even if Arthur you know, didn't get paroled this time, he gonna, he's going to have to be released eventually for good behavior. So what does it even matter? His actual quote is, uh, since he was paroled, he lived a, a very conforming life as far as parole is concerned. You can say, I can hold him for another two years. Or you can say, he's been good for 15 years. What good will it do to keep him two more? What do you mean what good will it do? It will at least keep people safe for two more years. It'll give him two more years to maybe, I don't know, fuck up in prison enough to get charged with something else so he can stay longer behind bars. Dr. Michael Stone, a professor of psychiatry at Columbia University and an authority on violent behavior, identified this parole release of Shawcross as, quote, one of the most egregious examples of the unwarranted release of a prisoner like in U.S. history in his 2009 book, The Anatomy of Evil. Arthur's parole required him to stay in Broome County, observe an 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. curfew. Uh, he was not allowed to buy alcohol, have contact with minors or go to places where minors could be present. Art connected with pathetic moron, Rose Wally, as soon as he got out. And this power couple, uh, relationship goals, uh, moved to the Binghamton area of New York. And they were welcomed with outrage. 
Concerned members of the public, furious, ran them out of town. Fucking love it. Then, residents of the town of Delphi and Fleischmann's, New York, also run Arthur and Rose out of town over the next subsequent months. In Fleischmann's, a person recognized Art at the post office. That night, literally an angry lynch mob led by the mayor himself gathered around Art's house, demanded that he leave. I love that so much. Finally, some people in the story reacting to how I think they should. Uh, wherever convicted pedophiles, savage pedophiles like Arthur Shawcross are concerned, I love vigilante justice. Uh, Fleischmann, uh, by the way, this town, town sounds cool as shit. Little town of just over 300 people. In 2018, The Dead Don't Die. That movie was filmed there. Haven't seen it, but I want to. A comedy horror mashup starring Bill Murray, Adam Driver, Steve Buscemi, Tilda Swanson, Rosie Perez, Chloe Savini, Selena Gomez, so many others. Uh, anyway, after an awesome, let's have more mayors like this kind of mayor, tells Arthur, fuck that guy Shawcross, to take his troll ass and go haunt a different bridge. Authorities uh, move he and his lucky lady to Rochester, New York, June 29th, 1987. So big win for Fleischmann's, uh, big loss for Rochester. July 13th, 1987, a senior parole officer, yet another idiot in this story, decides that the local police should be informed of Art's presence in town, but not be informed of his actual criminal background, right? His criminal record is now officially sealed. Fuck that. Why do this piece of shit any favors? Let the angry mobs take him out. Let real justice take place, man. Fuck that clown. Why does he deserve to ever feel safe? Why does he deserve a chance to rebuild his life after what he did? When Art and Rose realized uh, they weren't going to be run out of town this time, now they settle down. Art dyes his hair black, right? Gains uh, 25 pounds so people won't recognize him. You know, he was crazy, but he could pull his shit together when it served him to do so, oftentimes, so not criminally crazy. Uh, He worked several temporary uh, jobs, labor jobs. Rose gets a job as a home health care assistant. In mid-October, they receive permission to move into an apartment on Alexander Street. Rose says the first few months in Rochester were a happy time. Then, of course, because this is Arthur Headwound Shawcross, you know, things change for the worse. Uh, Arthur starts getting moody, doesn't want to hear about Rose's day anymore. Rose will tell him she loves him all the time. He'll respond uh, just uh, that she should shut the fuck up. Uh, What did you expect, lady? How delusional was Rose? Uh, Despite his cruel treatment of her, Arthur shows odd kindness to others, right? Shovels snow, gives away food and clothes, acts as an unpaid handyman for some, uh, becomes close friends with an apartment manager named Yvonne Lemire, until he grabs her breast one day and she threatens to kill him if he does it again. And Arthur then tells her to watch out or she'll suffer consequences. So maybe they were not that close. Art soon gets a good job uh, or gets a, a job at uh, Bronia's Produce, a salad packing factory. In his free time, he, of course, you know, fishes the river and fantasizes about future murders. In January of 1988, Arthur starts dating a new woman, Clara Neal, behind girlfriend Rose's back. Man, some people can't ever get a date. This fucking mutant's playing the field. Uh, life is not fair. It really isn't. Clara lives uh, near downtown Rochester. She has 10 adult children. Uh, A few of them still live with her. She's been married from 1949 to 1974. Her marriage, not a happy one. Clara's husband accused her of cheating. So she went out and did it. Uh, She said, I told him if I got to bear the name, I'm going to play the game. That's a quote. That's a fun one. Her husband divorced her when he found out that Clara's child wasn't his. So many champions and role models and people who really have their shit together in the story. Uh, it's, it's, this is really like a, a big, you know, uh, promotional tourism piece for upstate New York. Uh, Clara and, Clara and Art meet in December of 1987 when Art is 42 and Clara is 56. Some of her kids worked at Bronia's Produce, you know, told her about the new hire. Clara asked her daughter to invite him over. Arthur came over for dinner. They fall in love. He promises Clara they're going to run away together in April of 1990 when his parole's over. <sighs> As the following months pass, Arthur becomes physically abusive towards Rose, who he now resents. He starts slapping, punching her during arguments. She lies to his parole officer, says they're closer than ever, more in love than ever. She's afraid to lose him. Not afraid of being hurt more by him, afraid to lose him. Well, what happened to you, Rose? What, who hurt you before you met Shawcross? Guessing Rose didn't have a good dad in, in her life. The world always seems to have a, uh, a shortage of good dads. Chronic good dad shortage. March 24th, 1988, some laborers find the body of 27-year-old Dorothy Blackburn in a riverbed of the Genesee River. Arthur's uh, second... Yeah, in the area of the riverbed of the Genesee River. Arthur's second killing spree has begun now, officially. At first, these laborers thought she was a mannequin. One of the workers pulled the mannequin towards him with a steel rake, realizes dead body. Dorothy's body had been preserved by the cold weather, but the river had washed away potential evidence. Dorothy had been attacked and strangled, also had bite marks around her genital area, and parts of her genitals were either torn or bitten completely off. Again, Arthur's dark oral fixation. 
The police investigated her case, but it soon stalls. There just wasn't, you know, enough evidence to go on. The police assumed she was killed by a pimp or a drug dealer. Her case sadly did not stand out from some other murders of sex workers at the time. How terrible. Arthur, one of many monsters in just this one city at just this one point in history. Uh, Dorothy Dottie Blackburn was a sex worker, cocaine addict, and mother to three children. She went missing March 15th, 1988. She had lunch with her sister that day, gave her baby to a friend, started working the streets with her pimp slash boyfriend. She was waiting on some welfare checks to come in, needed the extra money. Dotsie left at 5.15 p.m. to go to work on Saratoga Street, around the corner from Lyle Avenue. Her boyfriend went to bed at 2 a.m., realized she hadn't come back by the following afternoon. He's worried. Dotsie had never left her child alone for an extended period of time like that. He asked around. Some people in the street said they'd last seen Dotsie get into a gray van, a, a brown Bronco, or a small light blue car. So he files a police report, March 18th. Arthur will later confess that he had driven Clara's car to Lyle Avenue, excuse me, on March 15th. It was an industrial area known for prostitution and drug dealing. Uh, a woman named Dotsie signaled for him to stop, that he paid her 30 bucks for mutual oral sex. Uh, he, of course, he said Dotsie bit him on the penis, but I doubt it, right? He would later be believed to continually lie about what women did to him before he killed him, you know, justifying the murders. He wanted people to see he was a reasonable guy. He just you know, he did what he had to do sometimes. And, uh, you know, his brain's not working real well. And who knows what reality actually looked like for him. He, he might have short-circuited in some of these moments. And maybe he thought this stuff happened. Uh, he said he bit her back in retaliation, then choked her until she lost consciousness, then tied her up with her clothes, drove out uh, to the uh, 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 out of town to the nearby Salmon River in Northampton Park. When she came to, he tells Dorothy he's going to rape her. Then she, he said she taunted him. Then he threatened to kill her. She called him a little man. Fucking doubt. She would say that to the man who'd already choked her unconscious, once who just threatened to rape her. So he chokes her again until she goes limp, until she is dead. Arthur then sat with her body until midnight, doing God knows what to her remains, then dumps her body in the river, drives back to Rochester, looks for signs that someone noticed she was gone, then goes to a coffee shop. Threw Dotsie's clothes into a dumpster. Next day, cleaned the car, returned it to Clara. In the following months, he becomes a regular client on Lyle Avenue, going by the nickname of Mitch or Mike, and hunting new women to kill. In early 1989, Arthur and Rose get married, kind of. She was still married to her ex, so it wasn't a legal marriage, but they have a ceremony and they invite, quote, a lot of people over, right, to this wedding. And exactly two of them show up. And this illustrates the disconnect Arthur had processing reality versus fantasy, right? Clearly thought he had a lot more friends than he did. And she did as well. Arthur never seemed to understand what other people thought of him. He didn't understand that because of his past crimes, people didn't like him. They didn't want to be around him. Uh, September 9th, 1989, the body of 28-year-old Anna Marie Steffen found on the banks of the Genesee River. Local man Hector Maldonado climbed down the gorge to look for bottles. On his way back up, he saw something on a ledge below the rim of the gorge. It was a green garbage bag covered with sticks and asphalt. Leg bones poking out. First, he thought it was a deer carcass until he saw clothing. It was warm and Anna's body had decomposed rapidly. The medical examiner listed her cause of death as probable asphyxia, probably strangled. Uh, the Monroe County Medical Examiner's Office uh, hired a forensic, anthro forensic anthropologist to mold a clay face around the skull, images put in local papers, and then a 50-year-old man called to say that the girl might be his daughter, and then dental records confirmed it. How sad. Hadn't seen Anna since Christmas 1988 and hadn't reported her missing because she moved a lot and he didn't have her most recent address. And what is, again, sad day for a parent to read that paper, realize that's your little girl. Anna Marie was emaciated, addicted to cocaine, almost nine months pregnant when she left home. She spent most of her early life caring for her sister, Tina, who was born with spina bifida. Her sister died in 1980. Anna's life lost direction. She got married, had two kids, but became estranged from her family when she got addicted to drugs. Anna was arrested on July 8th, 1989 on prostitution charges. Was last seen working near Lyle Avenue. Didn't come back to her apartment she shared with other sex workers. After several weeks, there were rumors that she had died of AIDS in jail. According to Arthur, he picked Anna up, took her to a construction site, Paid her 20 bucks for sex, started having sex, but then some kids ran into the area, told her not to move, but she wanted to put her clothes on and leave. He kept asking, uh, uh, you know, or he, he kept asking her to be quiet. She kept asking her or him to let her up. So, you know, he had to lay on top of her. Uh, he'd put on a lot of weight, by the way. He was huge now. He's over, he's, he's six feet tall and over 300 pounds. When Anna threatened to scream, he choked her until she died. You know, he had to. Then Arthur rolled her body off a cliff later that night. October 21st, 1989, some fishermen find the body of Dorothy Keller now on Seth Green Island on the Genesee River. They came across a pile of bones and clothes just off of a trail. No skull. The medical examiner guessed that she was killed by blunt impacts to her body. Her body went unidentified, unidentified for some time until a jail employee realized he hadn't seen Dorothy Keller lately. Reports confirmed she hadn't been seen since July. Dorothy was a new type of victim, not a sex worker, 
a 59-year-old homeless woman. She'd been missing since July 29th, 1989. Arthur later confessed that they had met in June of 1989. Dorothy was a waitress at a diner he liked, right? They were friends at first, then it turned into an affair. Then Art hired Dorothy to clean his apartment for $4.25 an hour. And one day she wanted to go fishing with him. He agreed to take her. They spent the morning fishing, having sex until noon, he said. Then it started to rain, so they huddled up in a shelter. And while huddled up, Arthur was like, hey, uh, how come you stole money from my house? He said, uh, Dorothy now threatened to tell Rose about the affair. He gets mad, so he picks up a log and beats her to death. Smashed her in the head. He had to. You know, she left him no choice. Then he hit her body under a tree, went home. Then he said he returned several months later, uh, removed her skull from the body, as one does, and just, you know, tossed it in the river. Why? Well, he didn't know. When asked why he did a lot of this shit in interviews, he would usually just kind of, you know, go quiet for a little while, then just kind of shrug his shoulders and say something like, I don't know. Never showed any remorse when asked about shit like this. Uh, would often say unprompted that he, I don't know, I don't feel bad about it though. Uh, I doubt she even stole from him. Another fantasy he probably made up to justify another murder. October 27th, 1989, the body of 25-year-old Patricia Ives found at a construction site behind a local YMCA. Boy ran behind the building to get his baseball, saw a foot protruding from a piece of cardboard. Patty was lying face up. She had no underwear or socks on. She'd been dead for several weeks. The medical examiner confirmed she had died of asphyxiation. She'd been missing since September 29th, 1989. Friends described Patricia as gentle and loving, but naive. They worried the streets would swallow her up. Patricia had dropped out of school at age 16 due to drug addiction. She first worked in a strip club, eventually turned to sex work. Her son was born addicted to cocaine, was taken into uh, county custody. Patty got arrested every few months for either drug or prostitution charges or both after that. Tried to change her life at one, you know, a couple times. She joined AA, later went to rehab, but always ended up back, you know, on the street doing sex work, addicted to drugs. She'd been missing for two weeks before her pimp Billy reported her absent. Uh, He was initially suspected of her murder, but cleared after an interview. So not a murderer, just a fucking huge douchebag. One witness saw Patty at 7.30 p.m. on September 29th. She was walking beside a white male on a bike. He parked behind the YMCA, followed her through a hole in the fence. According to Arthur, he met Patty at the same diner where Dorothy worked. Paid her 25 bucks for sex. They went to a construction site, had sex on a pile of dirt, uh, but some kids were around again. He tried to hide himself. You know, when he did, Patty allegedly tried to take his wallet. So, you know, he pushed her against the ground. Then she started to cry. So now he felt justified in anally raping her, strangling her because he's fucking crazy. He hit her body under some scraps of material and then went home after dark. The press now began reporting on these cases, reporting the possibility that a serial killer was on the loose. Papers started calling the suspect the Genesee River Killer. Uh, The police noted that the killer attempted to conceal the bodies, which indicated a strong possibility of a criminal or military background, right? He had both. They advised sex workers to be cautious, encouraged them to come forward with information. Detectives checked records to search for offenders living in the area, but didn't find Arthur's records because they were sealed. That's why he wasn't a suspect at this point. Had they not been sealed, good chance he's caught and a lot of additional women don't end up dead. And again, terrible decision to seal that record. Uh, Women continued disappearing. Sex workers weren't frightened or were frightened, excuse me, wary of men on the streets. The police determined that the killer must be familiar to these women. That's why they continued to go on dates with him, right? Sometimes the dates are successful. Through interviews, they start getting a description of a client named Mitch or Mike who was known to be prone to violence. Seemed a little off. Now they just got to find this motherfucker. Undercover officials patrol Lyle Avenue, posing as clients and pimps. According to Arthur, one day a man sat down next to him at a bar, started talking about the case, pointing out all the other undercover officers. Right? Arthur felt real smart about that. He also liked to frequent the local Dunkin' Donuts where he would talk to police officers about the case. They didn't give him specific details, but, you know, would tell him they were searching for cars, running plates, that kind of thing. Instead of lying low for a while because of all this, he just keeps trolling for more victims in the same car, keeps killing Also, he's playing little games like this, you know, talking to the cops, you know, he's crazy, but again, not criminally insane. He knows what he's doing. He knows it's wrong. He's taking steps not to get caught. On November 5th, 1989, 22-year-old Maria Welch goes missing. Maria went out to work on November 5th. She was scared because of all the prostitute deaths. She'd also had some violent experiences with clients recently. She limited her clients, tried to be safe, but also wanted more money to buy drugs. And that led her to a terrible decision this evening. Marie and her roommate worked the corner together the night she disappeared. Her roommate left to take a job just after midnight. When she got back, Maria not there, and she never saw her alive again. Arthur will confess to murdering Maria before her body is found. He picked her up from Lake Avenue, took her to a beach near the banks of the river. They set a price, began having sex. Maria said she was not on her period, but when he touched her, he saw blood. And again, according to only Arthur, now he asks for his money back, and she tells him to fuck off. Then he chokes her. Until she goes unconscious, he 
He, of course, had to, right? She left him no choice. Then he tied her up, inserted a bar towel inside of her, raped her when she woke up, then choked her to death. Then dumped her body in some bushes near the river. Dude was such an angry savage. What's he doing here? Just killing his mom over and over, maybe? Also, how weird is it that he shifted his sexual interest from young children in 72, boy and a girl, to grown women in 88 and 89? That is not typical. But again, you know, he was not a typical serial killer. Uh, November 15th, 1989, the body of 30-year-old Kimberly Logan is found. A man named Jimmy Thomas stepped, out of, stepped onto something hard outside his trailer on Meg Street. The body of a woman. She was naked, leaves stuffed into her throat, her clothes all around the scene. She'd been beaten, bruises on her abdomen. Kimberly didn't fit Art's traditional profile because she was a black sex worker. Uh, but, you know, there's the leaves in her throat. Uh, although the police suspected that Art killed her, he will deny it and he will not be convicted of murdering her. But enough people suspected that, you know, she was one of his victims. It felt wrong not to mention her here. Uh, November 23rd, 1989, the body of 30-year-old June Stott discovered in a field of tall grass. Mark Stetzel walking his dog in the suburb of Charlotte. Uh, he passed a cement plant in, you know, just outside of Rochester in Turning Point Park, an area used by ships and barges. His dog ran down a game trail to stand, uh, you know, to a stand of reeds. He sees a foot poking out of a rolled up carpet. J June was the second victim that didn't fit the traditional profile. Not a sex worker. Didn't struggle with drug addiction. Uh, she did have a mild, unspecified intellectual disability. Right. She'd been missing since October 23rd, 1989. She lived with a man named Joseph Tibbetts, who took her in when he learned she was homeless. According to him, you know, she was a shy woman, paranoid, occasionally experienced hallucinations. October 23rd, he left her in the apartment at 9 a.m. to go to uh, a betting parlor. A friend saw June drinking beer alone at a hotel later that day. Joseph reported her missing three weeks after her disappearance. They figured she'd gone to live with someone else, but grew concerned when he just never heard from her. June's body found horrifically mutilated. She had been strangled. Uh, quote, anally mutilated, whatever that means. It sounds absolutely hor horrific. Her labia had been completely removed and she had been slashed open from throat to groin. Her body found face down. Uh, lividity showed that her blood had settled along her spine. So someone had moved her uh, after death, you know, turned her over. The medical examiner listed probable asphyxia or asphyxia, excuse me, as her cause of death. So, you know, probably strangled. Uh, please call in assistance from FBI profilers led by agent Greg McCrary. They divided the 11 murders into subgroups based on methods and position. The profilers determined that the killer was a white male in his 20s or 30s. Strong, you know, they were close, a little older than that, but not much. Had a previous criminal record, was familiar with the area, knew the women. They were right about that. June Stott's injuries indicated the killer was comfortable around corpses. Uh-huh. Probably returned to the crime scenes to relive the attacks, which he did. McCray felt the police were looking for someone who was uh, weird and out of sync when they really needed to be looking for someone who seemed normal. Uh, safe to say McCray was, uh, was wrong there. I don't think he ever really seemed normal. During his later confession, Arthur said he met June in the streets, noticed how skinny she was, said he would get her something to eat anytime she asked. He saw her another day, offered her a ride. Then in November, he and June went to a local beach in Charlotte. They fed birds, went to a deserted area to have sex. Uh, they saw the rug near the cement plant. Sat on the rug, June asked him to, quote, teach her how to make love. Arthur, teach me how to make love. Art then followed her for a while, said he was going to have sex with her. According to him, it was difficult to get his penis inside of her. You know, impotence strikes again. Then he said that June said she was going to call the police. Now, does that story seem even remotely legit to you? Not sure what went on between those two and her final moments. I'm sure that wasn't it. Uh, this is Arthur's damaged brain creating some kind of fantasy story he may have believed was actually real. In another one of his accounts later of the events around June's murder, he said that uh, he made a comment during sex about June not being a virgin. So they did have sex in this account and then she started to scream. So he put his hand in her mouth to quiet her and then accidentally suffocated her. Also completely absurd. He said he then removed June's clothes, threw them in the water, dragged June and the rug into the trees. Then he cut her open with a jackknife. Why? I don't know. He shrugged his shoulders. He could explain why he did it. Also said he uh, removed some of her organs uh, and genitals, you know, and uh, ate them. Why the fuck would he do that? Uh, he said he didn't know. But he did tell one interviewer that she tasted like a pork roast. Told another that she tasted like a fatty steak. He loved freaking people out with some of these details. On November 27th, 1999, the body of Elizabeth Gibson found in the woods of Ontario, Wayne County, New York. Detectives learned that Mitch had been seen with her shortly before her disappearance. The police canvassed all the local bars, couldn't find this mystery Mitch character. Arthur later confessed that he stopped at a restaurant on Lyle Avenue the night she went missing. When he left, Elizabeth was sitting in his car because she was cold. They talked for 20 minutes. She asked him if he uh, wanted to go out. They started kissing, and then she panicked for a reason he didn't said. Uh, grabbed his face, dug her fingernails into his eyes, uh, doubted, or she did panic because she knew that he was a fucking maniac who was about to kill her. 
Uh, Art said he pushed her away with his arm, uh, pushed against her neck until she quit struggling. And then, you know, she, uh, she died or something. It's bad luck. He was just trying to defend himself. And uh, she went on, went, went and did died on him. Uh, that he dumped her body in Wayne County so the police wouldn't catch on to him. November 11th, 1989, the body of Francis Brown found in Genesee, uh, near the Genesee River. Or actually, I'm sorry, in it this time. A fisherman went down south, went down Seth Green Drive. Getting too excited. Calm down. Uh, passed a no public access sign. It was 3 a.m. He smelled something rotten coming from two large rusty cans, looked over a steep bank, saw what looked like a mannequin 40 feet down. You know, made it over uh, that way, saw this is no mannequin. This is a woman who is naked except for her boots. She was kneeling, clutching a cement block, kiss off, tattooed on her buttocks. Her remains were confirmed by her grandfather, Clem Brown. Oh, so sad. She'd been missing since early October. Arthur later said he choked Francis with his penis during oral sex. He choked her, choked her to death with his dick and then continued to rape her after her death. It's a fucking animal. Uh, dumped her down on the embankment. Uh, debris fell on her and then covered her body. On December 15th, 1989, 32-year-old Darlene Trippy now goes missing. Arthur picked her up from Lyle Avenue, drove to a parking lot behind a warehouse where they had oral sex, but he couldn't keep an erection. Uh, then she supposedly called him a bunch of names, doubt it, and he choked her. Then he dumped her body over a guardrail near a culvert, returned two or three days later to cut her genitals uh, off and eat them. Or so he said. December 31st, 1989, a guard at the Northampton uh, Park finds a pair of discarded jeans, birth registration card, and an ID. The birth registration and card belonged to Felicia Stevens, South Carolina resident, born in 1970. The ID belonged to Lillian Stevens. Uh, Lillian was Felicia's mom, hadn't seen Felicia in two to three weeks. They weren't speaking because she was involved in drugs and prostitution. Felicia's boyfriend hadn't seen her since December 26. Art later said he was driving down Plymouth Avenue on the Wednesday or Thursday after Christmas. Stopped at a red light. Black woman ran up to his vehicle. And for no fucking reason other than he was a sadistic maniac, he put the automatic window up and caught her neck like pinned her, then reached over and choked her. She started to scream rape. He lowered the window, grabbed her hair, dragged her into the car, and then choked her to death. And then just dumped her body in the park. Uh, okay. January 2nd, 1990. Helicopter crew searching for Felicia or Felicia spots a naked female body lying on the frozen river near a bridge in the forest. The woman was not Felicia Stevens. This was June Cicero's remains, 34-year-old sex worker. June had been severely mutilated, almost sawn in half, uh, cut to the bone around her genitals, which were completely missing. He, he, it seems that he did eat a lot of these women's genitals. The police chose not to remove her body right away. Instead, they decided to keep surveillance on the area based on this profiler's advice, right? That FBI guy, Agent Greg McCrary, he thought the killer would return to the crime scene. He's right. Uh, Arthur later admitted that he took June to an isolated area tried to have sex with her, got so mad that he couldn't get an erection that he strangled her. Then dumped her off a bridge over the Salmon River saying, I just closed the door and kept going. Two days later, he returns with the handsaw. That's when he cut off or cut out her genitals and ate them. Felicia was eventually found by a man named Richard Thompson, just west of Northampton Park. He saw a hand protruding from a brick foundation of an abandoned farmhouse called the police. January, January 3rd, 1990, the helicopter team patrols the area around June's body within two minutes of their flight see a man standing on the bridge next to a small van looking like he's either beaten off or taking a piss. I'm going to go ahead and say he was beaten off. They suspected he was a serial killer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, strong, you know, easy assumption to make, I think. Uh, coming back to relive the crime scene. All the patrol units are alerted and the driver speeds off. Art later admits he went back to the crime scene because, you know, he wanted to look at June's body while he ate his lunch. Uh, he didn't know he was under surveillance at the time. Captain John McCaffrey of the New York State Police follows the Chevy van as it speeds away from the bridge. Art leaves the area, goes to the Wedgwood adult home where his, uh, you know, Lady Rose is working. McCaffrey asks the attendant about the man who entered the home. They find him uh, in the basement, asked to interview him. Arthur said he was driving, stopped to pee, no big deal. Left because he saw the helicopter. He wasn't arrested that night uh, and goes home, but he is put under surveillance. January 4th, 1990, the police pick up Arthur to clarify some inconsistencies in his initial story. They take him to a golf course where he said he'd had a liaison with a sex worker. Then he goes to the station for further interrogation. January 5th, 1990, Arthur finally confesses to 11 murders after more than 12 hours of interrogation. He will later say, I just got tired of it. After 14, 16 hours, all that was coming at me, I, I couldn't handle it. In a lengthy interview, he gave excuses about why he was forced to murder each woman. One excuse I did not mention yet was that he thought that one of them had AIDS, but he didn't know which one. He thought that he got AIDS from one of these sex workers, even though he was like over 300 pounds and had no signs of having AIDS. Uh, and then he felt that killing them was a good way to stop the spread of AIDS. He was doing a public service. Come on, guys. 
He's a fucking hero. Wake up. He's a concerned citizen doing his part and keeping a public health crisis from claiming more victims. What was, he, what was he supposed to do? Just not kill them all? I think he was so crazy when he said shit like that. He half expected people to get on board and like thank him. Like they were just going to let him go. Like like the detective suddenly be like, what? Oh, really? Really? The age? Well, gosh dang, Art. Why didn't you say that first thing, buddy? We never would have arrested you, you silly goose. Hey, everybody. Uh, Arthur's not a sadistic psychopath. Uh, eating his murder victim's vaginas for sexual gratification. No, no. He's a hero. He's keeping our community safe from the AIDS epidemic. Come on, everybody. Sing along before I give him the key to the city and drive him home. For he's a jolly good fellow. For he's a jolly good fellow. For he's a jolly good fellow. He's eating AIDS push for our health. Hip, hip, hooray. Hip, hip, hooray. Like, I think that kind of shit probably played around in his fucking brain. Uh, Shaw Cross's attorneys now spent months preparing their defense. They work with Dr. Richard Krauss, one of the psychologists I mentioned earlier in the episode. Krauss said, uh, you know, of his first interview with Art, when I met him, I expected to find a pure sociopath. Instead, the deputy uh, led in a large-bellied, big-proportioned man with sloping shoulders, glasses, uh, God, glasses pushed down his nose, curly gray hair, and an alert ex- expression. Uh, he looked prematurely aged, like somebody's nice old uncle, patting his Santa Claus stomach and joking with the guard. And almost the first words out of his mouth were that he was really good at eating puss. And that's not a crime, is it? No, his uh, first words were uh, he was guilty as hell. A very unsociopathic thing to say. Uh, Klaus worked with Ronald Valentine, David Morante, and Thomas Cucuzzi, Art's three defense attorneys. Uh, Valentine hired him to determine the possibility of a psychiatric defense for, you know, the trial. Uh, through their interviews, uh, Kraus learned that Art's time, uh, learned about Art's time in Vietnam, his troubled childhood, his relationship with his parents. In other interviews, Art justified why he killed every woman. Krauss couldn't come up with a diagnosis, but he knew Art wasn't insane, at least not criminally. Uh, he knew what he did was wrong, did it anyway, tried not to get caught, was responsible for his actions. Krauss spent hours listening to the interview tapes and then came to a sudden realization. Art constantly said he was different. Maybe he was biologically different from other people. Excuse me. After months of searching, he found biochemist William Walsh from Carl, Carl Pfeiffer Treatment Center in Wheaton, Illinois. His lab studied people with poor impulse control and behavioral disorders. Uh, Walsh suggested analyzing Shawcross's blood and urine samples. Uh, J- uh, July 18th, 1990, Krauss gets the lab results. Shawcross had ten, 10 times normal amount of urine uh, cryptopyrrole, right? He didn't know what that was, so he contacts the director of the lab at St. Mary's Hospital in Rochester. Doctor also didn't know what it was, <laughs> said the lab had made it up. Second doctor had never heard of it, does hours of research, eventually learns that high levels of cryptopyrrole in the urine can possibly cause mental health issues and erratic behavior. Then on July 23rd, 1990, Krauss receives a letter from Smith Klein, the, the Smith Klein Lab in California. They determined that Art had an extra Y chromosome, right? He had sad, tiny nut syndrome, uh, also known as Jacob syndrome. Uh, this meant he was genetically predisposed to behavior disorders. Uh, with these two pieces of evidence, Art's defense strategy is set. Right? He did know that what he was doing was wrong, but he could not control his violent impulses, so he still wasn't really responsible for what he did, You know, still not guilty by reason of insanity. And even if that was true, which it might have been, in this case, don't you have to put this motherfucker down or away for life, right? There's no cure for this madness. Uh, October 1st, 1990, Shawcross goes to trial for 10 murders committed in Monroe County. Elizabeth Gibson killed in Wayne County, so he'll be prosecuted separately there. Arthur's trial is televised regionally, and got record high ratings. His trial lasted 10 weeks, was the biggest and most complicated murder trial in the history of Monroe County. Uh, New York law at the time allowed the trial to be televised in full gavel to gavel. WGRC, local cable uh, TV station, uh, broadcasted the entire thing. Many in the community believed that the televisation of the entire trial led to a carnival atmosphere. High school students came to watch on class field trips. Uh, The prosecutor had groupies. Jury even gotten involved in the fanfare. One day, they all wore matching bow ties. It's kind of funny. Uh, another day, five of them wore Notre Dame football jerseys because the judge recessed early to attend a football game. Yeah, it's also kind of funny. And come on, this is a pretty easy case. Art's defense argued insanity uh, resting on several factors. His upbringing, PTSD from the Vietnam War, absurd, py- or, you know, that absurd, uh, that pyral disorder. Uh, assists they found on his brain, likely created by one of those massive head injuries, uh, genetic defects, etc. cetera. Shawcross never testified at his trial. The defense was led by attorneys David Morante, Thomas uh, Concuzzi. The defense played tapes of Arthur's interviews with Dr. Dorothy Lewis, a Yale psychiatrist hired by the defense, known for her work with serial killers. Uh, Art was hypnotized during some of the interviews, and while he spoke, he switched in and out between his regular voice and a high-pitched female voice. 
Uh, probably not like that, but maybe it was because he was so weird. Probably not like Mickey Mouse. In his interviews, he describes his relationship with his sister, his crimes in Vietnam, relived an episode of sexual abuse from his mom, said his mom's voice urged him to kill women, said that she helped him with one of his, one of his murders. Dr. Lewis diagnosed him with PTSD, Dissociative Identity Disorder, uh, aka Multiple Personality Disorder. Many other doctors, especially more recent years, have not agreed with fucking any of this, and they find that Dr. Lewis was a quack. Uh, yet again, we see memories recovered from hypnosis being trotted out in court. We've learned since that uh, notoriously unreliable, thanks to false memory syndrome. In Dr. Lewis's opinion, Arthur took on the alternate personality of Bessie when he murdered victims. At another point in his hypnosis, he took on the personality of uh, Aremus, a cannibal from 13th century England. <laughs> okay, all right, this doctor, uh, yeah, maybe uh, not doing a Yale uh, a great service here with her, with her uh, you know, work in this case. Um, Arthur said this individual, or Aremus, taught him how to eat human flesh, okay? Uh, Lewis concluded the murders were the product of years of abuse and trauma. She really seemed to have uh, fallen for this clown's bullshit. Her main theory was that all the years of abuse and brain damage caused Art to have a partial seizure. Before murders, he'd be triggered by some sort of event, maybe pain for getting a, uh, getting a blowjob, and then he would see a bright light, and then he'd wake up later, presto, change Oh my gosh, how'd his body get here? Mom, d- damn you, Bessie! I didn't call a camel. No, mom. Damn you, Aremus. I, I just like to eat vaginas. Uh, just fucking some cartoonish craziness. Uh, the jury hears all this and uh, thankfully are smarter than uh, the Scott Peterson jury was, in my opinion, that I talked about last week. And they're like, get the fuck out of here. Prosecution led by first assistant DA, Charles uh, C- Siragusa. He and his team dissected Shaw Cross's early life so they'd be ready to dispute psychiatric defenses. The prosecution disputed all his claims about his childhood, military service, you know, brought in people he served with. We're like, what? Fucking no. Uh, Sarah Goose told the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle in 2008, by the time the trial came around, I probably knew more about Arthur Shawcross than he knew. Nice. And uh, don't doubt it. The prosecution psychiatrist, Dr. Park Dietz, claimed that Arthur faked all his mental illness to avoid prison. Dr. Dietz testified that Dr. Lewis invited Art to play the roles which led him to making up Bessie. Again, leading questions. Been proven to create false memories under hypnosis. Uh, Dr. Dietz also claimed that uh, DID or multiple personality disorder, not a real diagnosis. And there is still debate over whether or not it is real and uh, if it is real, how it actually manifests. Dr. Dietz did diagnose uh, Art with antisocial personality disorder and said that while he was mentally ill in that way, he was fully aware of what he was doing. On December 13th, 1990, after six and a half hours of deliberation, the jury finds Arthur Shawcross guilty of all 10 counts of murder. February 1st, 1991, he receives a 25-year sentence for each victim, killed him in Roe County, right? 250 years. With the second trial looming after the first lengthy and expensive ordeal, the public opposes the second trial, citing taxpayer burden. Art's defense attorney, Ronald Valentine, gets him to consider a plea deal, which he takes. March 29th, 1991, he pleads guilty to the second degree murder of Elizabeth Gibson. And he receives another life sentence to run concurrently with the 250 year sentence. Then Shawcross is ordered to serve his entire sentence at the Sullivan Correctional Facility in New York State. July 10th, 1997, Arthur Shawcross and Clara Neal get married at the Sullivan uh, County Correctional Facility, right? The the lady uh, he uh, met when he's working at Bronius Produce, what the fuck? She married him after he'd been found guilty of killing all those women, and she knew about the two kids from 1972. When asked about the marriage, Clara would say, it was nice and all. It took 10 years to make the grade, but I finally did it. It Fucking took 10 years to be worth a, a marriage to Arthur Crazy Boy Shawcross. She was... Fucking, ah, there's so many idiots in, this, idiots in the story. So many sad people. The public outrage. Art was allowed conjugal visits with Clara as they should have been. Uh, when he had sex with her, I wonder if he fantasized about those kids he killed or if, or if he fantasized about the women he killed. Uh, November 10th, 2008, after years of conjugal visits and also after making some money, selling some paintings he made in prison. That's awesome. Arthur Shawcross finally does the world a favor and fucking dies in Albany, New York at age 63. He had lived 63 longer than he probably should have. Uh, The day he died, he complained about a pain in his leg. He was transferred to a hospital and then died later that day from an orderly forcing his dick into Art's mouth and choking him while another orderly cut off Art's dick and fucking ate it to him in front of him. Hail Nimrod! Uh, I wish. Uh, I meant to say ate it in front of him. I don't even know what I said there. I worked up. No, he died of cardiac arrest. A lot better death than he deserved. Now let's get out of this monster timeline. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely.
Uh, before I share a few final thoughts, we have another sponsor. Uh, today's Time Suck was brought to you by Rent a Daddy Guy. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'm Arthur Shawcross, uh, founder of uh, Rent a Daddy Guy. D- do you need a daddy guy to push your kids on a uh, swing set? <laughs> Do, uh, do, do, do you want a daddy guy for some rough housing? Uh, when your little ones step out of line. Dad, do you need a daddy guy to push some grass down their pants? Maybe maybe give them a, a bare bottom of spanking or stuff them in a trash can. <laughs> what about taking them fishing? Do you need a daddy guy for that? What about showing them nudie pics? Uh, do you need a daddy guy to uh, talk to them about sex? Maybe show them some sex stuff. Me and my other daddy guys, but right now, just me, we'll be happy to come to your home or to a playground or the woods near your home. And chase your little guy around. <laughs> Maybe chase other kids around. You don't even have to pay me. Just, just tell me where the kids are. Or hanging out. I'll find them. Even if they already have a daddy guy in their life, I'll be another daddy guy. A secret daddy guy. I'll make sure they play careful on the monkey bars. And i make sure they don't drink too much of the beer I give them. <laughs> I'll make sure they get nice and clean when I give them a bath. I'm a, I'm a good daddy guy. And when, stop it, Bessie. You're, all, you're a bad daddy guy. Stop it. And when, I mean if, they go missing. I'll, I'll have a look for them. I'll probably know where they are. <laughs> so call 1-800-DADDY-GUY. Wave bye-bye to those kitty pies. 1-800-DADDY-GUY. Let me keep an eye on the kitty thighs. I mean pies. I'm a daddy guy. Holy shit. That was a, that was a fucking creepy ad. We've had a lot of creepy ads on Time Suck, but that was probably the creepiest. But you know what? But fitting for such a creepy episode. Uh, I think I might have blacked out for that. Arthur Shawcross, what an absolute fucking maniac. Dude was born with some real, real bad brain wiring. Then he got hit in the head. Hard. Many times. Got knocked out by a rock, discus, a uh, sledgehammer. A fucking sledgehammer. Fell off a 40-foot ladder. Uh, other sources listed more head injuries. I just, since they didn't show up in all of them, I didn't list all of them. But there was, you know, he got fucking knocked out playing uh, football. Got knocked out, uh, got hit by a car, taken to the hospital. Uh, a lot of head injuries. This combination of head injuries, some brain scans would reveal a very fucked up frontal lobe, very poorly functioning. Some genetic abnormalities, learning disabilities may have truly created a child who, uh, you know, truly was the bane of his mom's existence. And then maybe his mom and his dad, you know, maybe or probably just weren't emotionally or educationally prepared or intellectually capable of dealing with the kid with all these problems. His school probably wasn't able to help a kid like that either, right? Not back in the 1950s. So now he gets bullied, he gets picked on, he gets made fun of for being weird, stupid, he's confused. Uh, He truly doesn't think properly. He starts getting angry, starts lashing out, picking on smaller kids, hurting, killing animals. Then the head injury, scrambling already blurry reality so much further. He has sexual problems, maybe genetically, right? Maybe he does get molested. He develops strange fantasies, has no one to talk to about these fantasies, has a hard time distinguishing fantasy from reality. Then he's sent to Vietnam. I don't think he did any fighting, but what if he did visit some real shady brothels? where there were young children who were very vulnerable, where he could do whatever he wanted, you know, whatever he wanted to them. What if that situation flips some very dark switch on in his head, then he comes back home wanting to recreate the really shitty things he did in Vietnam, or at least thought about doing. Now he ends up in prison for arson. How did that impact his already fragile mind? What happened to him there? What fantasies uh, did he run through his mind over and over and over? Next, when he gets out, he starts playing with kids at the fucking playground and no one stops him. How did those interactions fuel his deviant sexual desires? Then finally he snaps, acts out on one of his terrible impulses that he had a hard time controlling for God knows how long. If any chance of him ever becoming a contributing member of society wasn't already shot to shit by that point, it sure was fucked now. Now he's a fully formed monster. And once he was captured, it seems like prosecutors should have put a lot more thought into how they could make sure that monster never, ever, ever roamed the streets again. Hopefully cases like his will be used by more and more judicial systems to help ensure that anyone else like him does not ever get back out after committing the type of crimes that he committed. Not everyone can be rehabilitated. Not everyone deserves a chance at being rehabilitated. I think very strongly. Uh, Time now for today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Arthur John Shawcross. Born on June 6, 1945 in Kittery, Maine. An odd but not dangerous child initially, but then when he was in third grade, his mom finds out that his dad had another family in Australia. His home life gets more stressful. He doesn't handle stress well. Seems a big ball of mental illness, emotional, and perhaps other types of abuse, genetic abnormalities, uh, head injuries start rolling down a long hill towards multiple murders. Uh, Number two, Arthur Shawcross's first murder victims were two young children, 10-year-old Jack Blake, 8-year-old Karen Ann Hill. Both murdered in 1972 in Watertown, New York. Uh, 
Art already had a reputation for playing with the local kids before they went missing. Make sure your kids, if you have them, aren't playing with the weirdo like that anywhere. Call the police. If they tell you about a guy like that, look into the weirdo yourself. Number three, when Art got out of prison in 1987 for murdering Jack and Karen, he went right back to killing within a year's time. And he kept killing. 11 victims, right, uh, at least, until he was arrested again 21, 21 months after he had started killing again. He terrorized the streets of downtown Rochester for almost two years, able to get away with it for as long as he did in part because authorities had his arrest record sealed. Let's not do that anymore. The rest of us deserve to know who these motherfuckers are and what they've done. Number four, Arthur Shawcross, despite his troubles with sexual dysfunction and odd behavior, had four wives and a long-term, long-term girlfriend, Sarah Chatterton, Linda Neary, Penny Sherbino, uh, Rose Wally, Clara Neal. With Valentine's Day coming up, you know, uh, I don't know. Maybe that's all uh, weirdly inspiring. I mean, if he can find love over and over again, uh, you know, you can too. Lucifina says so. And number five, new info. Speaking of finding love in 2001, this piece of shit received news that he had a daughter. When he was on leave from the military in the late 60s, he had a romance in Hawaii. 40 years later, Maggie Deming discovers who her dad is, decides to make contact. Maggie's husband tried to convince her uh, not to talk to Arthur, but she felt like she had to meet him. She told the interview with the serial killer team, a documentary uh, on Shawcross, currently uh, able to be seen on Netflix. He was very gentle. Uh, she, she wrote Gentile here, but well, gentle. I'm assuming. He was very gentle. He was very soft spoken, very grandfatherly to my daughter. The children that he had killed are the same ages as my children now. That's going to be between him and his maker. Yeah, she introduced her kids to their fucked up biological grandpa. Maggie continued visiting her father until his death, as did some of her seven kids. Shock Ross would say of Maggie, she's cool, with a little, you know, sh- shoulder shrug and the flat affect on his face. I would say of Maggie, why would you do this? Why, why, why? More confusing behavior in a story so full of so much confusing behavior. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The Genesee River Killer has been sucked. Hot damn. Right, that was a wild one, wasn't it? Wasn't that one especially weird? Uh, thanks to Bad Magic, the productions team, uh, for all the help in making Time Suck every week. Thanks to Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, for running our family's lives, being a great co-host on Scared to Death. Thanks to the Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley for production, being a great co-host on As We Dumb. Thanks to Bitelixer for keeping the Time Suck app running smooth. Logan, the art warlock, Keith, for fucking nothing! No, kidding. Uh, <laughs> We're trying like, his best. He's <laughs> 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 I just feel like shaking it up. Uh, no, thank you for creating all the merch at badmagicmerch.com. Also running socials with Liz, the Enchantress Hernandez. Uh, thanks to Liz, uh, again, for running the uh, private Facebook page. We have the Culty Curious page with her, uh, moderators. And thanks to Beefsteak and his mod squad, keeping all those meat sacks happy on Discord. Uh, thanks to producer Olivia Lee for her initial research on Arthur Shawcross. Hopefully she's not having nightmares. Uh, next week on Time Suck, we're going to go back to ancient history with a man who was legendary for the bloodthirstiness he had in the carnage he created. A guy who, I mean, you know, overall was uh, maybe a lot scarier than creepy uh, fucking daddy guy, Arthur Shawcross, Till the Hun. Till the Hun was the leader of an ancient nomadic people known as the Huns and the main force behind the creation of the Hun Empire. Till and his Hun army fought the, fought the Romans in the waning days of the Roman Empire, using their fierce fighting abilities and expertise in, on horseback uh, to sack numerous cities across Europe. Born around 406 CE to a noble Hun family, Attila came to power with his brother, Bleda. Then, uh, Bleda sort of disappeared. Speculated that Attila had Bleda killed. Uh, he would go on to lead many invasions of Roman territory over the course of his life, inflicting massive destruction and growing the Hunnic Empire uh, to stretch from Asia to parts of Europe. His people amassed an incredible amount of plunder. Attila bullied the eastern half of the Roman Empire into paying the Huns thousands of pounds of gold. But while Attila was responsible for destroying Roman cities, he was at one point also an ally of the western half of the Roman Empire helping them fight other barbarian groups, including the Burgundians and the Goths. Then before Attila could truly complete his legacy, before he could launch an invasion that would have almost certainly taken him into the heart of the Roman Empire, he died abruptly in 453 CE on his wedding night. So who was this man? Was he really as terrifying as his enemies made out he was? How the hell did he manage to bring the Roman Empire to its knees and how did he die? So all that and more next week on a historical edition of Time Suck. And now let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker Updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker Updates. I'm going to kick things off with some Irish madness. 
Uh, I'll have Scott and Lacey Peterson updates next week. I've been uh, cataloging those as well. I added these ones before that episode dropped. So the Celtic mythology suck reminded super sucker Colleen Pacocha, or Pacocha, there we go, Colleen Pacocha of her great grandma, who sounds like she was quite the character. I, I love this message. Colleen writes, Hail sign of the suck and minion of Nimrod. Just finished listening to the Celtic suck and it reminded me of a story my dad used to tell me about his childhood. His very Irish grandmother was a bit of a bitch. <laughs> she always dressed in black and delighted in scaring the shit out of my dad and his siblings with stories of scary Celtic creatures. When she would babysit, she would hide in closets and jump out at them screaming like a banshee. One night after babysitting, she was hit by a streetcar. Oh my God. And killed on her, on her way home. My dad said his father always felt guilty for not driving her home, but my dad said he felt like the banshees were pissed off at her for imitating them and they came for her. I got the impression that he didn't miss her that much. Also, I wanted to tell you that I'm a uh, 70 year old grandmother who loves Time Suck. It is by far my favorite podcast. Oh, thank you. I've got my son addicted to it now too. Keep on being curious and sharing that with the world and keep on sucking Colleen. Well, Colleen, I love that you love Time Suck. Also, your great grandma, she sounds like a, uh, she sounds like a fun one in a way. I mean, maybe she was a bitch or maybe she was just very, very funny, right? I feel like there's a decent chance that her and I would have gotten along pretty well. Uh, Hail Nimrod, Colleen, a great Irish name, by the way, Colleen, and uh, keep on sucking. I think it's Irish. I've always associated Colleen with being an Irish name. Uh, next up, shamed sucker, Dory Killeen. Dory Killeen, that sounds Irish again, uh, got Cummins Laud kind of. She shares another grandparent-centric message, writing, Hi, Dan. I hope you're doing well. My name is Dory. I've been listening to your podcast since the very beginning in 2016. My wonderful sorority little sister, Rebecca Reba Lil, uh, who used to help out with the pod, introduced me, and it was love at first sight. I love Reba. Uh, somehow, uh, all this time, I've managed to avoid having awkward encounters while listening to the pod until recently. I was taking my 80, 82-year-old grandma to a doctor's appointment, and I plugged my, good for you, and I plugged my phone into my car. I listen to your podcast or Small Town Murder every single time I drive without fail. It's become second nature, so I really didn't think anything of it. Well, I was wrong. You started talking about shaped genitals, and my grandma looked at me like I had 12 heads. And you kept going on and on about how there are square vaginas and cylindrical-shaped penises. And I, <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing. My grandma screamed, Dory, what do you listen to? It was more hilarious than mortifying, but I definitely wanted to share. My poor little old grams is very concerned about me now, haha. Uh, my grandpa, her husband, who is unfortunately no longer with us, would have loved your podcast. He used to listen to books on tape when he worked in New York City during his commute to and from work. My grandma giggled about how we have similar tastes and things we listen to. I'll take that as a compliment. Thanks for all that you do. Stay healthy and safe. Keep on sucking, Dory. Well, thank you, Dory. I love that you can have fun with your grandma like that. Your grandpa sounds like he was fucking awesome. Your grandma sounds fun uh, as well. And yeah, until Reba High, she was so great to work with, as was her sister, Sarah, the, the Lily ladies, uh, the Lily people. Can you not say ladies? I, I like that word. Uh, they're the best. I'm very fond of them. Uh, now, an old lie claims a new victim. Sad sucker Danny Craig is upset that there is not a magical poultry creature in the ocean. She writes, you absolute motherfucking <laughs> fucker. I'm currently on a mission to listen to all the time sucks. Uh, currently on the Bermuda Triangle episode, and my God, was I invested in the chicken of the sea. To then realize it was all a fucking lie. Chicken of the sea is tuna and not adorable little chickens that live in the sea and lay eggs on the ocean floor. You fucker. Keep on sucking. I hope you enjoy this update. I did enjoy that update, Dan uh, Danny. I, 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 wait, I wrote Danny and now I'm second guessing. Why am I doing that? All right. Your name is Danny. I think I had Dory before. Danny, uh, I too wish there were actual chickens who lived in the sea and could breathe underwater. It would make for some cute and hilarious nature documentaries. They'd be so fun to watch when you're high. Uh, thanks for checking out the, uh, the back catalog and hail Neymar to you. And now a much heavier message from a top shelf meat sack, inspiring meat sack who's doing a lot better than she was, Kelly. Kelly writes, hello, Captain Boy Who Cried Wolf. If you read this on the show, please only use my first name. This is going to be long and I don't give a shit. So settle in. Fair enough. Holy shit, you know how to put shit into perspective. Uh, so a few nights ago, I'm sitting on my bed, listening to the podcast, doing my nightly ritual of holding my entire bottle of Xanax in my hand, trying to find a reason not to swallow them all. You finally gave it to me. Let me explain. I found your podcast last September at a uh, time I really needed a reason to laugh. At that time in my life, I was smack dab in the middle of having to literally cut my toxic sister out of my life. Her, my mom, and one of my nieces had been living in my tiny ass apartment with me. She had been so mentally and physically abusive, I had to have her arrested and obtain a protective order in order to even get her out. My mom chose to leave with her and live with complete strangers because she was angry with me for calling the cops on my sister. 
On top of dealing with that, I'm also battling PTSD and severe depression stemming from the summer of 2020. That summer, I took my first ever vacation to the Rockies in Colorado. There, I was kept in the mountains for two weeks by a person I thought was my friend. Turns out he was not. For the next two weeks, he sexually assaulted me, threatening to leave me to the fucking bears. He would tell me I owed him and that he was the victim. We were so far uh, up, my phone never had service. I have asthma and chronic bronchitis, so walking away was not an option. I had to keep myself from puking while I slowly gained his trust. Eventually, I talked him into going down the mountain to rent a campground so we could shower, etc. He raped me again that night in the shower. Once he was sound asleep, I grabbed my bag and took off. That was about 5.30 in the morning. I managed to find a ride into Colorado Springs, was making my way to the bus station when he began blowing up my phone. When the woman saw how freaked out I became, she convinced me to call the police. I did. The deputy met me at the bus station, took my statement. He then, instead of going to the campground to arrest him, told me there was nothing he could do. Just left me there. I didn't have enough money for a bus ticket home. He had taken all the money I took with me early on. I managed to find help via Facebook, but the bus wasn't leaving till the next morning and the station closed at 11 p.m. I walked across the street to the fire station feeling defeated and dirty. After about an hour, a few of the firemen came out, asked me if I was okay. I lost my shit. I began crying uncontrollably, attempted to tell them my story. One of them called for a female officer to come and talk with me. She came, took me to the police station. I told her all that had happened to me. Victims advocacy came, put me in a motel room, helped me make it to the bus the next morning. The state of Colorado has since decided not to file charges because I live out of state and they cannot find him now. This is more mess. Uh, there was more messed up shit I've been through in life. I was sexually abused as a child. My first marriage was a physically abusive one. My ex fiance was emotionally abusive. I've had several miscarriages. I've been homeless for a huge chunk of my adult life. On top of all this, I have bipolar disorder and take no meds at it as it is medication resistant. That means that any meds they put me on stop working after a little while. Six years ago, I chose to not put my body through the constant change of medications anymore. I only take the Xanax to combat the social anxiety and panic attacks I now suffer because of these sexual assaults. Anyway, back to me sitting on the edge of my bed contemplating suicide. I'm sitting there staring at roughly 50 pills in my hand. Your podcast is playing. I've been kind of jumping around the backlog, trying to keep up on the current sucks because I've had a lot of time in my hands the last three weeks. Fuck COVID. So there I am just staring at these pills, thinking to myself, I can't do this anymore. When the suck on Joseph Fritzl comes on. Now I feel like a total tool for thinking the way I was thinking. If that woman could endure what she did and keep on swimming, so can I. What she went through makes the two weeks seem like fucking Disneyland, right? Two weeks, yeah, in the the mountains. I decided right then and there to seek help. I now have a therapy appointment in two weeks. I live in a small town. There are no groups close for rape survivors. I'm thinking about starting one. So thank you for all that you do and all you help, even when you aren't trying to. Also, I wanted you to know I am a pagan leaning on the Wiccan side, and I wanted you to know you did an excellent job on the Celtic mythology mythology suck. Thank you. I was actually super stressed out about that, like weirdly stressed out. Uh, That shit is hard to understand, and I've been practicing for over 30 years. If anyone emails you with hate shit about it, you just tell them to drink a cup of chamomile tea, smoke a joint, and suck your wizard staff. I also wanted to share what I think would be, uh, should be done, or what I think should be done with rapists and pedophiles. Hear me out. I'm on board with this. Uh, Take them out to the woods, strip them naked, nail their dick to a tree with a rusty nail, cover them in honey, give them a dull hacksaw, leave. Bam, done. I like it. I wish I would have done with uh, Shawcross. Uh, Damn, I feel better again. Thank you for being you. You haven't gotten me yet with any of your tall tales. I haven't been Cummins Lod yet. I'll let you know if or when that happens. Until then, stay crazy, stay funny, and keep on sucking. Well, Kelly, hot damn. You are strong as fuck. Uh, Lucifina is impressed by your tenacity. Uh, I'm inspired. So glad you didn't quit. I mean, I mean, who the fuck knows how many people going forward you are going to help? How many lives will your life save, right? Your story, one, 10, 100. You just have to keep marching forward to find out. And, and I have no doubt uh, you will. And you are going to help so many, an untold amount of people. So glad my weird ass can help you in some small way. And yeah, you help me too. We all need perspective realignments. Uh, I need them all the time. Uh, hail fucking Nimrod, you, you goddamn champion. And one more from another awesome sucker, Katie Daniel, uh, who made me feel good writing, know what? Praise Bojangles and hail Nimrod for your mush mouth. Good morning, you silly bastard. Just listened to the first episode of 2022 where you said there's unfortunately no fix to your mush mouth. And that is partly because you can't design exactly what you want to say. I think it's also partly because you're so excited to tell us what you've learned. And I hope you never lose that enthusiasm. The enthusiasm to learn more is certainly uh, rubbed off, has certainly rubbed off on me, and I know it's rubbed off on other time suckers. I truly believe the desire to learn more is what will save the world. Much love to the whole Bad Magic crew. I'm a better person because of you all. Katie. Fucking thank you, Katie. Yeah, I do get excited. I'm an excitable person. Uh, 
Uh, I hope I always get excited. And uh, and I'm so lucky you uh, you know y'all keep listening uh, in spite of the way I talk. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it's inspiring to some of you in a weird way. Kind of like how Arthur Shawcross can be uh, inspiring romantically. Like if he can, if he can get dates, right? And fucking look at the way he acted. Maybe you think like, well, if that guy can make a living talking and he can barely speak one language, right? That's that's inspiring. Um, and uh, and hopefully it's inspiring in a way that you know, like you don't have to do what's quote unquote right, right, to make something that people love. You can do it in your own weird, broken, fucked up, non traditional style. There's so many different paths to success. Yours doesn't have to look like literally anyone else's. So, Hail Nimrod, uh, you uh, beautiful bastards. Thanks for always reminding me that there are a lot more great people in the world than there are people like Arthur J. Shawcross. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Uh, thanks again for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast, Meat Sacks. Uh, if you take a, a serious blow to the head and start thinking about choking people out or eating their uh, vaginas... Uh, maybe don't ignore, you know, what's happening there. Maybe schedule a therapy appointment, uh, start wearing a helmet, ass always wear a helmet, stay alert, stay aware, and, you know, keep on sucking. Add Magic Productions. All right, here is a, uh, a little clip of Arthur talking from one of the many interviews he gave. This one is uh, shown in an interview with the serial killer. And yeah, just such a disturbing dude. Always a bad man, I mean. You never can get rid of it. He's behind a door somewhere. I'm trying to keep him there. I don't want to hurt nobody else. Really? Really. Uh, just a final question, Arthur. I mean, what, what, why won't you talk about the, the two young Stop. Children. It's over. Is it, not because, is it because you're ashamed of it? It's disconnect. It's, this is over. So interesting. Okay. Earlier in the same interview, he talks about, you know, eating people's parts and everything. But then when it gets to the kids, he just won't talk about it. And that whole thing about, like, keeping that bad guy from getting out. I mean, man. What it would be like to uh, get inside his head before he died and see what that world looked like. Uh, w- wouldn't want to do that. Wouldn't want to do that. Looks like I do it from like like a remote place, like some little movie. Maybe watch clips up for a second. I don't think I could take very much, but yeek! Scary, scary dude. Glad he's gone.